For those of you who are just joining, if you look in the chat, there will be instructions on how to select a language channel. In the lower right-hand corner of your screen, you should see a globe. If you click on that globe, you can choose either English or Spanish. This broadcast will be simultaneously interpreted while we are going in both English and Spanish. Wonderful. Uh, and good morning and welcome everyone to the Wisconsin Broadband Summit. My name is Brandon Hofsted, and I'm the Community Economic Development Program Manager with the University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison Division of Extension. It is my pleasure to open this summit and to welcome hundreds of fellow participants from across the state of Wisconsin and the country. Today's summit is focused on how communities can increase broadband access and move closer towards digital equity. Specifically, we have organized this summit to help Wisconsin communities enhance broadband access by understanding the importance of broadband to economic development, exploring models for active uh, network and leadership development, uh, accessing and applying mapping data and survey research techniques to understanding broadband access, and uh, finally learning about available funding options to Wisconsin communities. We are excited you're able to join us for this conversation. Before we begin, I would like to thank our event sponsors, including the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, uh, the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin, and the Wisconsin, and then of course the University of Wisconsin Madison Division of Extension. And Laurie, if you could uh, go to the next slide, please. So those are our event sponsors, and a special thank you to the U.S. Uh, Economic Development Administration. Today's meeting was made possible in part by a grant from the U.S. EDA Port of the EDA University Center, <laughs> University of Wisconsin Madison. Before turning it over to our presenters, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, tonight's, today's meeting is being recorded uh, and we are using um, the, the final recording will be posted on our website for everyone to, to view later. Also, we are using the meeting format. Um, so that means that all participants can see one another, but we will be spotlighting our speakers uh, for your convenience so you can find them easily. Um, as was noted, for those who are uh, already admitted, we are offering this in um, both English and Spanish, and you can find that at the bottom, um, the globe at the bottom, and please choose the channel of your preference. Uh, it is also being closed captioned uh, for those who are interested um, in using that feature. As a friendly reminder, please be sure to mute your microphones when you are not speaking. Uh, when we open the floor, we will try to open to question and answer, but when, when we do do that, um, please feel free to use either the raise your hand function or drop a chat, uh, a question into the chat. Um, we will have people monitoring, both myself, uh, again, you can find me, Brandon Hofstede, uh, and my colleague, Kristen Rungi, um, will uh, be the ones monitoring the chat, and you can send us a private chat if that's your preference as well. Finally, this is uh, three hours, so um, we will have some transition between speakers. So, um, you know, feel free to step away as you're able because we will not be taking a break um, during this, uh, during the summit. So with, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, the Dean and Director of Extension of Uni University of Wisconsin, Madison, uh, Dr. Carl Martin, who will offer a brief welcome and introductory remarks. Carl. Thanks, Brandon, and good morning, everyone. Um, we almost started with a break this morning because when I went to log in, you know, I was logged in my computer. When I went to Zoom, all of a sudden I got this message, your Google is shutting down and is inoperable, which is not really what you want to see happen at 8.55 when you're given a presentation at 9 o'clock. Uh, but fortunately, rebooting the computer solved that problem. Um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And thank you for allowing me to, to get us started. We have a great lineup of speakers and panelists who will help us fully understand the challenges and opportunities our communities face when it comes to broadband. Here at Extension, we have a unique perspective into Wisconsin communities. We are a statewide network of UW-Madison, embodying the Wisconsin idea of leveraging, leveraging university research to create community-based solutions. We work with residents in every community in Wisconsin, as well as the five tribe, as, as well as five tribal nations. We provide support and guidance across a wide range of topics such as agriculture, natural resources, health and wellness, <laughs> as well as family, youth, and community development. We are made up of a diverse set of talented educators who work directly with participants and partners to make a difference in the lives of Wisconsinites. At Extension, we conduct research with and for the people of Wisconsin, but that work doesn't stop there. We know the emerging and longstanding hurdles residents are overcoming to and prosper. 
we've ele elevated and dedicated capacity to address the big issues that we can make an impact on. And of course, one of those key issues is broadband access. So what type of coverage do you need to have broadband? Well, the FCC's most recent minimum standards are 25 megabytes per second download and three megabytes per second upload. So significant equity issues arise when you have an individual or business who is below the minimum and others who are above or well above the minimum. I also realized this recently, um, I also realized this doesn't necessarily correlate to your distance from an urban area or a population density um, that you live in. I live about 20 mi 25 minutes south of campus here in Dane County. We have eight megabyte per second internet, not great. Last month, my oldest son, Lincoln, and I went on a fishing trip to Canada, pretty much in the middle of nowhere. And I was worried about logging in for some required meetings. Well, it turns out the lodge I was at had recently purchased Starlink, which is Elon Musk's satellite internet. And the minimum broadband at the lodge was 40 megabytes per second, and it averaged 100 megabytes per second. And this is 50 miles to the closest blacktop road. I joined a campus call with my dean colleagues and the provost, and had perfect audio and video, which is not what occurs when I do it from my house here in Dane County. Of course, that caused a lot of questions from my colleagues why I was on a lake and had a, a fireplace in the background, but that, that's a whole nother discussion. Um, and I'm not advocating for Starlink um, or that it's the magic bullet, but there is quite a contrast in broadband speeds. And we, we see that same contrast here in Wisconsin. Recently, Governor Evers named a Blue Ribbon Commission on Rural Prosperity. And after months of work, this panel noted some serious implications of broadband deficiencies across the state. Access to state programs is hindered by unreliable internet access. In fact, the commission called participation in these programs <coughs> a non-starter for many people who just couldn't access the information in the same way people in other communities can. The report cited broadband access as a baseline requirement for community success. This summit is aligned with the findings of that commission. And we know from our research that this is much more than a rural issue. There are homes in many areas that just don't have internet access. People are impacted by broadband access in ways that don't always seem obvious. Starting a business or relocating a business is highly dependent on broadband access, no matter where you are in the state. Our society is connected together through the ability to find and gather information quickly and share resources across the internet. We know from our work how important this topic is. For some of our partners and participants, broadband access is a struggle that they must overcome to have the same opportunities as others. This is an issue that spreads across sectors. Broadband is linked to better business performance, farm profits, and enhanced opportunities for entrepreneurship. It is also linked to higher home values and higher educational outcomes. Broadband access also corresponds to improved health outcomes, which can lead to higher worker productivity. Um, I'll tell you that lodge in uh, Canada that I went to, they have now a competitive advantage over their competitors who do not have high-speed uh, broadband. Um, so one you know, microcosm example of how important it is from a competitive standpoint. To show you just how much this means to our state, I wanna share a story from some of our staff in Southwest part of the state. More and more school assignments are being assigned and managed through online delivery. But some families lack the ability to get their, these materials, which are required as part of K through 12 schooling. So the families will get into their car and head to parking lots of local libraries to work on their assignments using whatever signal they could get from the building. I've also heard they would also go to McDonald's parking lots. McDonald's provides broadband access. Um, more of our interactions are online. More of our touch points are between people, uh, between people are now in a digital space. More resources that we need to live our lives are posted on web pages. This is true for us in extension. This year we have returned to in-person programming and public events, but we still reach more people virtually. We are holding webinars for farmers, we are moderating online discussions between teenage 4-H members. We are holding online summits like the one today to engage people on crucial issues. And the truth is our, audiences, our audience is responding in a positive manner. We have high rates of participation in these spaces because they are easy to schedule around and attend without a huge time commitment or travel to contend with. 
We've learned from our audiences that in-person interaction is vital and that online spaces are just as important. Some of, our, some of the feedback we received was that if we don't hold programming online, some of our participants just won't, wouldn't be able to attend at all. That's true for young people, professionals, adults, really anyone we work with. In response, we are working to support communities to accelerate broadband access, increase adoption, improve digital literacy, and reduce digital inequities. We're expecting more of our families in terms of online learning and living. And we need to make sure that they have the tools to do this effectively. The pandemic has made us all aware of broadband issues in a new way. And those issues haven't gone away. Of course, schools are back in session and libraries have returned to no normal hours. But that lack of access remains. It's still a problem. Your, participa your participation here is one way to move us forward. We have a great lineup of experts, researchers, and community leaders who will detail the realities of broadband access across the state. Um, and, and really citing the issues that we face, I mean, whether that's a business, whether that's somebody located in a, an area without broadband access, how do we get at those practical challenges and how do we solve that problem? This isn't a new problem, but it's a problem that I think we all agree needs to be solved and needs to be solved soon. Thank you again for joining us and being part of the solution. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing the presenters today and hearing questions and your input um, on this session. So welcome everyone. Great, uh, thank you, Carl. Um, so I'm gonna, we're gonna move it right into, uh, speaking of the chair of the governor's task force, um, our first speaker, um, Brittany Beyer. Brittany is the chairperson of the governor's task force on broadband and executive director of Grow North Economic Development Corporation. In her role as director of Grow North, Brittany supports the economic development activities such as workforce housing, workforce development, and of course, broadband uh, in the furthest northeast corner of the state, an area encompassing eight counties and three tribal nations that are 100% rural and with a unique forestry rich landscape. Her role inside a broadband, uh, role inside broadband expanded this summer uh, in the 20 of 20, in 2020, as she was named the chair of the governor's task force on broadband access, where she convened 25 members of a task force for the year, delivering a report to the governor and the legislative body in June of 2020. Brittany will provide an overview uh, on enhancing broadband access in Wisconsin. So Brittany, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much for inviting me to uh, present on this panel. Um, uh, this is gonna be a wonderful topic for everyone to understand a little bit further. Um, I assume I'm supposed to ask to um, advance the slides, so um, please do. Uh, and advance one more. Uh, so as Brandon said, I'm the director of Grow North Regional Economic Development Corporation, um, overseeing eight counties and three tribal nations in the Northwoods, upper northeast section of the Northwoods to be exact, uh, one of the nine regions of economic development in the state, um, which has been a great uh, resource in understanding how we can work collaboratively throughout the whole entire state. Um, in addition to serving as the chair of the governor's task force on broadband, I was selected as a commissioner on the Blue Ribbon Commission on Rural Prosperity. So what Dean Martin was talking about was something that I actually saw firsthand as we were trying to, during COVID, do this important work uh, for the state. Um, there was a definite understanding that uh, broadband was certainly an issue in rural communities, which is why there was an intentional link between the Blue River Commission on Rural Prosperity and the task force on broadband. Uh, please advance. A little more context, uh, in July of 2020, the governor uh, created an executive order calling for the task force on broadband. Uh, we were asked to deliver a report to the legislature and the governor uh, on June 30th of, of this year, which was delivered on time. Um, and all of us are living within the year of broadband access. We've seen many um, hundreds of millions of dollars start flowing in this direction even as of this week, right? Uh, so there's real intention inside of this. 
Uh, and the 25 members of the task force met um, August 2020 right away through May 2021. And we're going to be resuming actually a little bit further um, after the PSC was able to award those $100 million that just were um, uh, over the summer. Um, we're now getting back to that work. The subcommittees that we worked on included policy issues, funding, mapping, and data needs, community network building, and digital access, because all of those touch points were really important and the five pieces that we knew we'd have to solve. Uh, please advance the slide. Before we did that work, uh, we wanted to see what was already in place in the state. So we were not um, making decisions that were um, and not clear for individuals who were uh, following one set of um, ideas versus another. So uh, the PSC was the convener for the task force of for a task force on broadband and will be and they have their own strategic plan. So I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of these goals for resil resiliency, accessibility, affordability, and high performance. And one I want to raise, especially for this group, is the resilience part. So every Wisconsin community will have access to at least one gigabit per second symmetrical broadband service to anchor institutions, such as schools, hospitals, government buildings, business parks, and enterprise centers by 2024. And being in a rural community, some, some portions of that are already in place. The schools and hospitals certainly have that access, um, but our government buildings, including town halls, including um, our emergency services, are not necessarily wired at that, that capacity. Business parks and enterprise centers, um, some of them are owned by a county government, right? Um, some of those are not uh, wired to that gigabit per second. These are not um, uh, mandates, but they are goals. And something that I'd like to lift up, just because we didn't get to specifically calling out that in the task force on broadband. And as I've been working on this with community members, it's been one piece that helps them think about a larger strategy um, but accessibility, you'll see reflected in a couple of slides coming up. Affordability is part of the way that we were trying to solve this. And high performance is really uh, very important. So you'll see their own goal was to have 75% of Wisconsin homes and businesses wired at 100 megabits down, 20 megabits up. Uh, you'll see that number reflected now with the federal grants that are coming down, and those are the minimum speeds. So everything is starting to align, and we wanted to make sure that we have that base level covered. Uh, please advance the slide. And um, I believe everyone received um, a, a packet of different items that they could access. Um, I did provide that PSC, uh, that uh, strategic plan, and the copy of the report. Think, I'm pretty sure and you're what on. What I would also say is that I mean, it says closing um, broadband. If somebody can mute themselves, thank you. Um, so the report is. Uh, caged in the three A's, so accessibility, affordability, and adoptability. Uh, I'll talk about the speed goals section, mapping improvements that we were talking about, and funding, um, and that network of collaborative efforts that is really important, um, and will it will be expanded on throughout this entire three hours. Please advance. So the top recommendations, um, these are the top recommendations. I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. Um, increasing construction and permitting coordination was an interesting one that came up because um, there was real interest in figuring out how to combine uh, road projects with potential broadband infrastructure build out, right? So if people could signal faster the, the capacity to um, get something put together by either a county or some other um, ISP, that would be really very beneficial. Um, you're going to see information about establishing a digital equity fund um, over and over again. And I think that's a really important um, way that we can structure some of the needs inside of this. 
Uh, and uh, especially coming from a rural perspective, establishing a coalition of willing, engaged broadband leaders to connect communities and providers, local and regional partners, planning and technical assistance opportunities, funding and resources. This is certainly something that uh, a lot of communities need around the state, and, and we are not going to take our eye off of that. Um, next slide, please. So what are the three A's? Access, affordability, and adoption. So access really means, it, in, in blunt force ways of thinking about it, infrastructure is just absent. And for so many community members, that is part of it. Um, the other option is they have access, but it's just not delivering the speeds that are necessary. So there needs to be improvement on that side. Affordability means the cost is just too high, partially because of income constraints, or um, in many places, the, ex the connection is way too expensive to be practical on a, their budget. And that needs to be addressed as well. And ad adoption means, um, you know, there's lack of access because of lack of training. We saw that many times in uh, the communities where students had to be home educated. And let's say they brought their Chromebooks home, but a guardian or a parent didn't necessarily know how to troubleshoot issues. Uh, think about it in a di different way, thinking about um, um, you know, our elderly population and what happened when telemedicine was really the way that everyone was having to do their, their visits. If you don't know how to use technology, you're not going to get the best of care inside of that. And you can go to the next slide, please. So, um, so access and affordability and adoptability, they actually are inside of the whole entire urban and rural perspective, right? So it's almost like a sliding scale. And, um, and that's really important to remember. Uh, I'm not going to read this and I'm just going to go on to the next slide, please. So we, we set speed goals, um, thinking that we need to have some way to measure. What you'll see is the beginning marker with um, the governor's edict that by 2025, all uh, residents and businesses would have uh, access to 25 megabits download and three up. So we took that as the base and moved it up from there. What you're seeing is that with the federal government starting to talk about 100 megabits down and 20 megabits up as a new rule, that at, that those um, broadband infrastructure dollars are going to be tied to, we might see that move faster. But we knew we need to keep our eye at the other end because providers are talking about not one gigabit um, access, they're talking about nine to 10 gigabits now. So 17.7% of the state has access to one gigabit right now, and it will have to be advanced. So we have some speed goals inside of that, which we'll track in the coming years. Uh, um, advance the slide, please. Uh, this map, uh, a lot of us understand that the FCC maps are a little bit off because of the census issue. Just wanted to make sure that everyone saw this map, which was from the Task Force on Broadband's report. To keep an eye on the 25 megabits down, 3 megabits up, so the tealish blue section. That um, will be an area that we need to advance as well. So if you think about the amount of the state that is going to have to have this infrastructure advancement, that is also inside of that uh, going on as well. Uh, if you can advance the slide. Uh, so uh, the FCC was approached by Congress in 2020 in March that they need to make improvements. We are expecting that not to happen earlier than 2024. So we have to be thinking about other items. And you'll hear stories from the members of the, um, the, the other panels about what they're doing in their communities. Uh, advance, please. And so um, the infrastructure build out and the funding for that is something that we'll be talking about. But simply put, the providers say that the areas where the return on the investment is there have already been served. So those public dollars and public-private partnerships really need to be part of it. And going on, please. Next. So think about the state channels of funding and the federal channels of funding and where they can overlap. So the summer, the $100 million grant cycle was related to the ARPA dollars. 
if I am correct, and I'm sure somebody can correct me if I'm wrong later, the um, upcoming $100 million grant cycle is related to the state budget this time. So you're going to see a little bit of a different structure inside of that, but everyone is keeping an eye on the infrastructure bill, which is a newer portion of the funds. They are gonna flow through the USDA, NTIA and FCC. Um, so think about not only always tapping into the state programs, but how do you access some of those federal programs? And I know some of our areas are starting to look at that. Uh, next slide. Uh, and just to touch really quickly on the need for network building. Um, reflecting back in the fall of 2020, the WEDC and PSC uh, did a pilot for a broadband connectors pilot. The application process was only open for two weeks and 96 communities applied. That really tells you the need. And so you, that's why you're going to hear about technical assistance and training and support inside of the response, because so many of the communities that know their need don't necessarily always have the resources right at their fingertips, and we need to be really cognizant of how to do that. Uh, next slide, please. So in closing, uh, I would certainly say that the real work is still ahead. I think we've started to build a, a framework of understanding with this force report to the legislature, um, but it's really um, a growing need for local communities to understand how they are partners inside of solving this issue. You'll hear plenty of stories of that. Uh, it's also really important to uh, note that Wisconsin's situation is not unique. Each of the states is struggling with this issue um, with different pluses and minuses. And then we know that we are going to have to figure out how to maximize the grant dollars that are flowing down and conversations like these are certainly important to make sure that happens. And I believe that's the last, next slide, which will be the last. So I will, of course, be um, listening in for the remainder of the, the time, and I'm happy to answer questions and happy to take emails. And thank you, for, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Brittany. Um, I appreciate your time here today and for joining us and for your service on the governor's task force. Um, before we move on, does anyone have any questions for Brittany or shall we hold those until the end? All right, seeing none at the moment, then I would like to introduce our next two speakers. Uh, next up is a joint presentation by two of our UW-Madison Extension colleagues. Uh, Dr. Conroy is an assistant professor of agricultural and applied economics who is um, working with the Division of Extension and Community and Economic Development and one of the co-authors, the lead co-author of our recent broadband report. Dr. Stephen Deller is a professor in the Department of Agricultural and Applied Economics at the University of Wisconsin at Madison and also a community development specialist with Extension. Steve's work focuses on modeling community and small regional economics to better understand the changing dynamics of the economy, assess the impact of those changes, and identify local economic strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Dr. Conroy's specialty includes a wide area covering community, community economic growth and development, small business dynamics, entrepreneurship, and broadband. So Dr. Conroy and Dr. Deller, welcome today, and thank you for your time here. I'll turn the floor over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Kristen. Good morning, everyone. Um, to some extent, I almost feel as though we're kind of preaching to the choir here a little bit in terms of the importance of broadband to the economy. But just to kind of reiterate some of the insights that we've gained through our research here, um, this is, let me, there we go. This is, um, again, a reiteration of some of the current uh, data that we have on access to broadband. This is essentially the FCC data uh, that uh, Brittany already kind of reviewed a little bit of and, and talked about some of the limitations here. But I think what's really kind of popping out here is the map on the, on the right. Uh, the, all the red are the census blocks without access to broadband. Uh, this is a, a large part of Wisconsin, uh, particularly rural Wisconsin, simply does not have access. The physical infrastructure is not there. Uh, and before 
COVID-19, uh, there really didn't seem to be much of a concern. But, but with COVID um, and the, the kind of the structural shifts to the economy that occurred, I think people are now realizing that you know, broadband has, has become a necessary condition for uh, community well-being. Uh, this is, I'm going to be sharing with you some of the insights that we got from this report that Tessa kind of took the lead on. Um, if you have not seen these reports, these are available on our website. Uh, we have a series of, of documents here. Uh, one is kind of more of a, a data orientation, more of a technical report. And then we have a shorter report that is more kind of talking about policy options, strategies. And then we have a series of shorter uh, fact sheets, if you will, kind of highlighting the, the key points here. So I want to review some of the economic side of this particular um, uh, report. Uh, some of the things that we want to consider in the disparities is there, there is still a significant share of the population without the internet. Regardless of whether you want to use the 25 upload uh, or 25 download three upload speed as the threshold, they simply don't have internet, period. Uh, there is still a rural urban disparity, at, but more importantly is that there's income level disparities. The rural urban disparities tends to be a physical infrastructure problem. They're simple, the wires are simply not there. But there's also an access issue in terms of income levels. And that's something that we want to come back to again. So there's really two issues going on here. One is the, the supply of the physical infrastructure. And the second is really more uh, affordability, the willingness to pay, or more correctly, the ability to pay subscription fees um, and demonstrating the relevance and, and education in terms of, and this is something that Brittany brought up, is that it's the technical skills of being able to actually use it. Okay, we've got it, what do we do with it? Okay, now, as we were doing our research, this is one particular chart that just jumped out at us. It was almost an, uh, a hob moment for us is this is the data that was behind uh, Brittany's comment about this kind of digital divide is not just a rural urban it's also an income what we have here are uh, counties that are grouped kind of by the most rural counties the smallest most rural counties at the top of the chart and the largest most urban places at the bottom of the chart and there's and then we also break it out by income levels from low income to higher income you'll notice here there's two things that jump out the first is that for all households kind of that badger red bar there you can see that the more rural places the percent of households or the percent of the population that does not have access to the internet is higher than the more urban areas. That's the rural urban divide, okay? The other thing that really pops out here is this kind of yellowish golden colored bar. That's households with low income levels, below $20,000. Although it's a little higher, the disconnect is a little higher in, in rural areas, you see um, over 40% of low income households in the most urban areas do not have access to the internet. This is the ability to pay argument, the willingness to pay and the ability to pay. The subscriptions are simply too expensive. So even if we have the physical infrastructure in place, there's a large proportion of the population that simply cannot afford it. And when we're talking about uh, uh, education, we're talking about K-12 education, we're talking about youth, this is really placing a lot of low income students at a real disadvantage. Okay, now one of the things we wanted to do was to try to measure how access to uh, broadband and the internet impacts the local economy. One of the problems is that we have lots of different ways of measuring this, okay? Uh, the, the kind of the, the, the one that drives a lot of policy discussion is the FCC data. But as Brittany mentioned, there's lots and lots of problems with that FCC data. We also have the American Community Survey data, which asks households and individuals a little bit more detailed questions. So what we wanted to do is to say, well, each one of these individually is not the best measure, but if we combine them into an index, that kind of helps us better understand. So what we have here is kind of a, a weighting scale, if you will, and I won't bother you with how we went about doing this, but essentially 
A higher value of this index is associated with better internet access. Lower values is lower access. The two kind of key ones is the FCC data and then the ACC simply say, we do not have internet, period. But there's two other ways in which people can get to the internet. One is cellular phone program data. You get it on your cell phone. Maybe you get a hotspot off your cell phone. But that's really kind of an inferior to actually having a physical wire. Yes, I get it. I have it, I have it through my cell phone but it's not really the best way. The other is satellite. Satellite technology is great for watching uh, Badger football games or Badger basketball games or the Green Bay Packers um, or streaming Netflix or checking your email. But in terms of doing what we're doing right now, this kind of live video conferencing, satellite really doesn't work that well because there's kind of hiccups and, and lags and, and it's just not quite there, okay? Now, what we've done is that we've kind of done a series of scatter plots here using data for Wisconsin counties. So each one of those dots there is, is a Wisconsin county. And what we got here is population growth. So we're looking at population growth relative to our broadband measure. Notice that there's a positive relationship here. So it's, Essentially, counties that have lower levels of broadband access tend to actually be losing population, okay? The higher levels, people are drawn to um, communities that have good broadband access. A study that I did with a colleague, at, uh, Brian Whitaker at uh, Oklahoma State University, we were looking at access to broadband and rural housing prices. And indeed, if you've got two houses sitting side by side and they're, they're basically identical, but one has broadband wire to it and the other one does not, guess which one sits on the market longer and actually gets a lower price? Okay, people are looking for those things. They're kind of expecting it. They're kind of demanding it now, okay? If we look at employment growth, we get even a stronger relationship here, okay? Broadband is almost becoming necessary to see any type of employment growth, okay? Graduation rates. Dean Martin kind of mentioned that uh, having access to broadband plays out in terms of education. Uh, graduation rates, we see a weak positive relationship here. But Wisconsin is kind of unique because Wisconsin tends to have a fairly high graduation rate, okay? But there is a, a weak positive relationship there, okay? But if you look at people's going on and getting additional training beyond high school, they're going on to higher education, uh, whether this is, is to one of the UW campuses, one of the technical schools, one of the, one of the uh, fabulous private schools that we have, there's a much stronger positive relationship here, okay? Having access to broadband is enabling people to actually go on and get additional training beyond high school. So worker productivity here and innovation of the workforce is really kind of becoming more closely tied to having access to the broadband. The other thing is health. This is uh, something that we were kind of not expecting, but we're finding a pretty strong relationship here between um, access to broadband and for but fair and poor health. And what this is, is, is kind of the movement towards uh, information uh, related to health and also in terms of telehealth. Um, one of the things that happened with, with COVID is the number of people that started to use, rely on telehealth to interact with their healthcare providers. The other is in terms of mental health. One of the things that has coming out of COVID is the impact on mental health. Um, so Tessa and I just came back from a, a conference, a first face-to-face -face conference in two years. Um, I miss the conferences. I don't miss the overpacked airplanes. Uh, but one of the things that people were presenting research on how COVID is impacting the economy. And one thing that came out was how COVID has really had an impact on people's mental health. And that this is actually kind of this, we're hearing a lot about people not wanting to go back into the labor force and people, the, 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 
the, the churn rate of people that are kind of quitting their jobs. Mental health and the impact of COVID on mental health is really kind of contributing to that. And that's something that we hadn't thought about. So things like being able to um, use telehealth technologies to talk to counselors or to talk to mental health professionals is becoming more and more important. Okay. Now, one of the things that we kind of question here is that is access and adoption of broadband really what's driving these results? Okay. Or is it that what, what we're really capturing is that broadband is reflecting or measuring low incomes and low population density ruralness? Broadband is not that those scatter plot relationships, that's not broadband. What it is is that you're capturing ruralness or urbanness and lower incomes. Okay, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to kind of test for that. And Tess and I debated about sharing, essentially what, uh, let me back up a little bit. Essentially, again, what we're doing here is that it's not the broadband that, that's reflected in those scatter plots. It's this, it's this low income and ruralness component there. That's really what broadband is, our broadband measures capturing is, is this and not, um, you know, actually having access to the internet. Tess and I debated about sharing this, but I, I thought I'd, I'd go ahead and, and share with you. What we did is that we kind of took our scatter plot analysis and took it to the next level. And what we used was this te statistical technique called regression analysis. So we redid the scatter plots, but we controlled for the percent of the population that's rural and median household income. Okay, so if it's really those two things, that's what we're seeing in the scatter plots, we should be able to account for that or control for that in this little bit more advanced statistical relationship. Now, the, the important result here is that column that's kind of in that gray column there. And let me just summarize, um, even after controlling for ruralness and controlling for household income, that broadband relationship still holds. So those scatter plots that we saw that we just talked about, we have pretty good faith that the results of those scatter plots are reliable. Okay, those patterns are there. I will point out one little difference here is the growth rate on unemployment. Uh, this, we estimated this using all the data for all the counties in the US. And just notice the little negative sign there in front of the, that estimated coefficient for a percent. This is for the nation. So nationally, having access to broadband really doesn't matter for, for employment growth, which was really surprising to us. But for Wisconsin, it does matter. Okay, Wisconsin is sufficiently different that in terms of employment growth, access to broadband matters. We think the reason for that is because the economic structure of Wisconsin tends to be kind of scattered around the state a little bit more. Unlike, say, uh, Minnesota, where, you know, the Twin Cities just kind of dominates the state's economy, and say, Illinois, where Chicago dominates the state's economy, Wisconsin, our economic activity spread around the state a little bit more. So having access to broadband across the state matters a little bit more. So you let me just- Three minutes left. Three minutes, okay. So access to broadband matters for community well-being. Okay, the three A's that Brittany was talking about. Access and adoption are two very, very different things. Access is simply building the infrastructure. Adoption is actually now we have it, we're using it. Okay, we need to avoid the trap of build it and they will come. So much of the federal monies and state monies coming down is focused on the infrastructure side, the, 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 the physical side, and less so on kind of the adoption side. There's a lot, there are programs in there, but they're kind of overshadowed by the physical infrastructure. We have to avoid build it and they will come trap. Okay. The way that we're thinking about it now is that broadband, particularly affordable broadband, has become necessary for a vibrant economy, but it's not sufficient. You can think of it this in terms of uh, having electricity. You gotta have it, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Transportation infrastructure, it's necessary, it's not sufficient. It's one piece of a complex puzzle. You gotta have it, okay? Much like electricity, clean water, uh, transportation, okay? Investing in the physical infrastructure of broadband is not a magic bullet. 
it's an important piece of the economic development puzzle. It's a, it's a bigger piece now, but it's not a magic bullet. Okay, so we need to think about how broadband fits into our broader economic development efforts. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve and Tessa. We appreciate the, the time today and your wisdom. I think we're going to hold questions for a moment, if that's all right, um, and until we're at the end of several of our sessions. Uh, and now we are going to turn the floor over to Chris. Chris Stark, I believe that you have our next speakers. Thank you, Kristen, and good morning to all. Here. Although much emphasis is our, of our summit, today is about best practices for communities and getting access to broadband. We also need to remember who Steve just referenced, and that's those who remain unserved because they may not be able to afford high-speed broadband or they cannot afford digital equipment or they lack digital skills to utilize that equipment. At the state level, we have recently formed a digital equity and inclusion stakeholders group led by Alyssa Kenny from the State of Wisconsin Broadband Office, the Public Service Committee to begin to address these issues, and we'll hear from Melissa later. Our next two speakers are involved in efforts to get broadband to the unserved. First, we'll hear about a pilot project from WEA Trust to attract private funders and help rural and low-income K-12 students get connected. Secondly, from Brian Gochi, UW Extension educator from the Lac de, Lac de Flambeau tribe, about tribal efforts to become connected. And with that, I want to introduce Steve Goldberg, Executive Director of WEA Member Benefits Foundation and member of that Wisconsin Digital Equity and Inclusion Group I just referenced to discuss his pilot project to help rural low-income students. Steve? Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I've been told I have seven minutes to cover this topic, which hardly leaves time for the uh, standing ovation. Um, Go back to the uh, previous slide, please, because I want you to see the, the topic that I'm going to address. We're involved in a pilot project to expand private philanthropy funding uh, for K-12 student internet access throughout the state. And as the next slide indicates, uh, we're serving as a catalyst to bring more philanthropy to the table. Uh, the WEA Member Benefits Foundation uh, uh, which is not the same as the WEA Trust. We're affiliated, but uh, they're, they're two different organizations. WEA Member Benefits Company provides insurance and retirement services for about 90,000 teachers throughout the state of Wisconsin. And we've asked a lot of those teachers and public educators what uh, issues keep them awake at night. And uh, this was during COVID. And one of the issues that they said keeps them awake at night <clears throat> is giving their students access to the internet for remote learning. So we also asked uh, DPI and the Public Service Commission what was missing from that equation. And they both told us a key missing piece is private philanthropy because private philanthropy is interested in supporting student access to the internet, but unsure, unclear about how to do it, uh, where to send the check. Some of them even send a check uh, directly to the Public Service Commission saying here, use this thousand dollars to connect more students to the internet. Well, the PSC can't do anything with that and they end up having to return the check. So we decided to establish a statewide funding model, a statewide funding model, a funding path that corporate foundations and others can use to support the connection of low income and rural student households to the internet. Um, we have a pilot project that uh, we have just kicked off. And as next slide indicates, uh, we've got some pretty important partners uh, helping us with this. Uh, the DPI, of course, the Public Service Commission, uh, the CISA Purchasing Organization. Uh, CISA and DPI, as many of you probably already know, have established a digital learning bridge that provides a voucher payment system uh, to help school districts connect their students uh, where there's an affordability gap. Public Service Commission liked the idea of this concept uh, so well that they uh, provided a uh, grant to help us pilot the effort in several school districts. And the next slide indicates a little bit more about the, uh, the pilot project. Started uh, uh, late September and uh, we're planning to run the pilot through August of next year. Uh, in addition to the Public Service Commission grant, 
uh, and money from the WEA Member Benefits Foundation. Uh, we also received a generous grant from the Alliant Energy Foundation before we even launched the pilot and before we even told other funders that we were interested in securing additional support, the Alliant Energy Foundation got wind of this because I'm not a shy person. And uh, they offered uh, a grant that uh, brought our total number of student households that we hope to reach with the pilot to 210 eligible student households. Uh, eligibility is determined by uh, income status and uh, school lunch, you know, reduced and free school lunch. Uh, status in five pilot school districts, whose names you'll see in the next slide, <clears throat> not the household names, the school district names, Janesville, Menasha, Shawano, Beaver Dam, and Sheboygan Falls. So we have a mix of uh, urban and uh, suburban and uh, uh, rural districts in these five pilot areas. We're using DPIs and CESA's digital learning bridge as the payment mechanism for this. And as a result of the learning bridge uh, and the work that DPI uh, and uh, uh, others put into the early development of the digital learning bridge, discounts have been negotiated with 39 <coughs> internet service providers throughout the state. Uh, and we are leveraging that. Uh, and next slide, I want to talk a little bit about what I call bulking and batching. <laughs> you can achieve pretty good group purchasing power to drive some pricing down if you can deliver a, a block of business to an ISP. And in this pilot, <clears throat> instead of having the ISP bill the household once a month for nine or 12 months, we are providing an upfront lump sum payment to cover the full 12 months of internet access at those eligible households. And you can imagine <clears throat> that gives us some pretty good cooperation from the ISP community. In fact, uh, some of them have even agreed that past due balances from those participating households will not be a barrier to provide those households access under this particular program through the school districts. Um, let me show you the next slide, which talks about why this approach is appealing to funders. I'm talking about private funders now. And I know that there is uh, a nice amount of government sponsored funding for uh, access and affordability gaps. But no matter how much money is available through the government, there will always be room for private philanthropy to participate in this kind of a program, especially if, as in the pilot, we are successful in getting funders to make more than a one-year commitment to the program. Uh, we are using an established funding vehicle in which funders can plug and play. They don't have to worry about becoming experts in this area. They don't have to worry about the technical aspects or the logistics. They just need to write a check. And we make sure that the school district um, is, is ready to identify eligible households, communicate with them, <clears throat> and enroll them. Uh, it's an opportunity for funders to adopt specific school districts. So if you're in a rural area and there is a funder nearby or a funder that has a market uh, interest in that particular area, we are, we're going to be serving as a matchmaker to help funders understand this, this opportunity and connect them with school districts that are interested in this kind of a program and that are already serving that particular area. Um, it's fun to play the role of matchmaker because <clears throat> that's the missing piece. The dots haven't been connected even though funders are interested in supporting this kind of school and student connectivity, <clears throat> they just haven't known how to do it in the past. So here's what we're learning from uh, the pilot. <clears throat> uh, the pilot's in very early stage. And I know we're building up to the standing ovation, so I'll try to be quick. Potential funders are expressing interest. <clears throat> They've heard about the pilot because we're very active with the Wisconsin Philanthropy Network. The Wisconsin Philanthropy Network, uh, which uh, has philanthropic organizations from throughout the state, has offered to help us take this show on the road. In other words, once the pilot results are available, um, we're gonna have a lot of help promoting the idea of funders adopting school districts. And funders are standing by waiting for results of the pilot before they make a decision. We're clearly on the right path. Um, we're gonna have an impact on student remote learning and telehealth. And as uh, Steve Deller just uh, talked about, um, I, I think that we're gonna see uh, that this particular approach 
is is needed. It's timely. Um, it offers, I think, some simplicity and more direct uh, opportunities than some of the government funding that uh, is involved. There's less red tra red tape, uh, and we are helping to facilitate the interaction between the school district, the eligible households, and the ISPs to make sure that this pilot works. It's exciting. And uh, I want to thank you for saving your applause until the end. Uh, but thank you for that, Steve. Thank you very much. So now I would like to introduce my good colleague, Brian Gochi, UW Extension Educator from the Lakta Flambeau Tribe of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians on tribal efforts to secure connection. So Brian, thank you. Yeah. Anin Buju. Can you hear me, Chris? I can, absolutely. Okay. So my name is, as Chris said, my name is Brian Gochi. I'm the Lacta Flambeau Tribal Community Development Educator for Lac Flambeau Tribe via UW Madison Extension. And uh, my presentation is twofold. One, to kind of talk about working with Native Nations in the state of Wisconsin. And two, to tell, talk a little bit about what we're doing here in Lacta Flambeau. Uh, next slide, please. So many of you are aware of this. We have 11 federally recognized tribes in the state of Wisconsin. And in this slide, you can see their, their uh, particular logos. Uh, next slide. So I wanna emphasize, and this is very important that all uh, sovereign nations are unique. All tribal communities and their governments are unique. One does not, uh, one tribe talk for the other. Um, so we wanna emphasize that at, right at the beginning and that's why it's important to, to talk about this. Next slide, please. So you can see the map and the locations of, of the tribes, including Brothertown, which is a non-federally recognized tribe in the state. But uh, you can also see the designated uh, sort of territories over a historical perspective within the state also. So when from this point on, when I talk about tribes, I'm gonna sort of fold into talking about Lac de Flambeau, my, my community. Next slide. So when we talk about uh, tribes, we're talking really about sovereignty. And tribes have a government to government relationship with the federal and state governments and are seen as tribes, as uh, nation states. So when you look at the power of self-government, that's also the power of regulating commerce and trade and developing economically. And broadband in, in, in my community in Lac de Flambeau is seen as a necessity, uh, utility necessity more than a luxury. And it also sets that environment for economic development and telehealth and education and basically improving the quality of life. And sort of what Steve uh, Deller was talking about, it's not the answer all when it comes to economic development, but it does set the environment. Next slide. So when we're talking about government to government relationships, there's a couple of different orders that, are, that exist. One is the executive order from the federal side of things that basically dictate that agencies, federal agencies, have the obligation to consult and collaborate with tribal officials. Um, and that shows you that perspective of uh, uh, government to government discussion. State of Wisconsin has the same scenario, executive order 39 and order 18. 39 is basically affirming that same cabinet discussion with tribes. Order 18 is talking specifically about emphasizing that uh, uh, tribes are sovereign and recognized so through the state of Wisconsin. Um, so if we wanna go a little bit deeper into that, any provider, local government or entity interested in working with tribes should be aware of these two scenarios. Um, in fact, the FCC has an Office of Native Affairs and Policy, and it was established to, to bring the efforts to bring the benefits of modern communication in all native communities. So when you think about that, there's already that relationship between the tribes and the FCC, and they are there to ensure that government to government consultation with tribes. 
So when we're talking about providers and other ent entities wanting to work with tribes, that's, that process has already been set in place. Um, next slide, Chris. So I'm not gonna uh, dwell on all these. You, you can read these as you go, but just remember two things that I do wanna emphasize in this slide that no tribal leader speaks for all tribes of the state of Wisconsin. And not all tribes are wealthy. I think we run into that a lot here in Lac de Flambeau that uh, just because we have a casino that we have these resources that we can just uh, chime into or dive into. And I just wanna emphasize that those resources are like our tax base. So those resources are already accounted for in areas of law enforcement, uh, education, housing, economic development, et cetera. So they get spread across, across the board. So when we talk about these, uh, these things, especially with broadband, we, we're looking for assistance like anybody else, okay? So a couple of quick thoughts here, quick stories, if you will, about what maybe not to do. During the uh, uh, NTIA grant application, which we were a part of, we had a provider approach us last minute and asking us to sort of uh, put a grant together and they can become our provider here in the area. So basically we write a grant, give them the money and then they're off and running. And that didn't sit well with the tribe. Uh, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, the other thing is under consultation when it comes to any other provider or entity is to uh, make sure that you're actually having consultation because we have a provider in the area already that uh, has not done that. And in fact, what they've done in the past is sent a letter saying, uh, basically, please see this letter as our consultation. And that was it. So that's not good for building relationships with tribal communities. Next slide. So if you want to, and I'm talking about providers or colleagues or anybody else here, if you're looking at sort of a grassroots approach of, uh, of developing a relationship with tribes, there are some key partners or positions within tribes that might make a lot more sense from a grassroots perspective. They have, a lot of the tribes have planning departments, community development programs, economic development corporations, tribal administration, and, and that's where you kind of start with. And I'm sorry, I can't provide all that contact information for all tribes, but we'll see if we can get you at least one link to give you a good starting point during, the, during this uh, summit. Um, but I just wanna talk a little bit about our local broadband team. Uh, it was, it was uh, established in 2020, just prior to COVID, but COVID sort of emphasized the importance of it. And that uh, broadband team locally consisted of the Lac de Flambeau Tribal Planning Department, Tribal Administration, uh, the, the Business Development Corporation of the tribe. Um, we also have Gil Hike from UW Extension was part of that, along with our Vilas County Economic, Economic Development Board chair and myself, I was the facilitator of that group. And some of the things that we really emphasized was that affordability, number one, and, and looking at what can we do to make sure that this is reached out to all members of the, of the community, not just tribal members, because Lac de Flambeau is a checkerboard reservation. So we're looking at all members within this, this community. Um, so we did a lot of scanning of the environment. Uh, we looked at different trends that are out there. Uh, we looked at different strategies, um, talked to providers, multiple providers, uh, uh, an ex one existing provider along with, with many different options. Um, we also applied for the one of the uh, PSC grants, technical assistant grants and received that. So that was a tremendous help through this process. Um, so there's a lot more I could say about this, but we're still working on it. We were able to apply for an NTIA grant um, recently. And what we did with that was to uh, um, go middle mile and last mile to all homes within the reservation. So we're hoping that we'll, we'll be seen in a favorable, favorable light. But uh, next slide, Chris, and I'll be done here. So if you look at these uh, four areas, building that relationship with tribes, you're looking at respect for the culture, 
uh, relevance, whatever it is that you're working with, be it broadband or anything else, that it has re uh, relevance to the tribe and reciprocity that it's a long-term relationship, not just a one-time shot. And the responsibility of uh, participating in decision-making both ways. It's not a one-way street that both parties are sitting there at the table making these decisions. And there's a lot more I could say about the, these things, but uh, I'm fit, trying to fit a lot of information in in a very short window. Thanks a lot, Chris, appreciate that. Uh, and I'm done at this time. Absolutely, and thank you very much. And Kristen, I think I will uh, pass it off to you. I have to hold questions because of that. We're a little behind the times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Steve and Brian, for being with us here today and sharing with us. Uh, next, we're going to turn to our first panel discussion on active networking and leadership. Our moderator for this first panel is Gail Hike, a community development and broadband specialist with UW Extension, uh, UW Madison Division of Extension, and also with the Governor's Task Force on Broadband. So, Gail will introduce our panel. Off to you, Gail. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, Laurie, would you advance the slide for us, please? Uh, we're going to look at active networking and leadership, and I like to think of this as the secret sauce. This is where we start connecting the dots, the where and the how. Um, as we take a look at this, looking at broadband can be scary if we think we have to approach it from um, a technical standpoint. I'm not a techie person, and I concentrate more on this networking and leadership, and that's the foundation, if we can start with the, the foundation of the networking and leadership, you're going to be off to a good success. Um, one of the things I find as I work with communities around the state, often they'll jump right to funding. How are we going to build the infrastructure? Where's the money? Um, if they start there, we don't see a lot of success. So what we really want to concentrate in is how we can help communities build the network and leadership they need for success. Um, this takes time, it can be messy, uh, and but once we do that, I think folks see the great rewards. Communities to look need to look for not just the obvious partners as they're networking, but expand how they can expand their resources. And most important, I always say, you need to find a champion. Who's the champion who's going to help lead this project forward? Next slide, please. Brittany talked about the PSC and the WEDC's pilot project that took a look at some technical assistance. Um, and what we were really doing with those technical assistance projects were looking at how do we build some of their, their networking, their leadership that's going to help them move forward in the project. Of those 96 projects, we often found they fell or not often, but all of them fell within three tiers of networking. They had that entry level um, where folks were just getting started. Um, some of them might be asking, how do we get started? Some had established some local committee and they had begun some exploration of the situation and some planning. The other next group is the middle. Um, these are the folks that have had some success. They've got a committee established, They've done some research, maybe some survey work, and are, have written probably that first grant um, looking at either local dollars or state dollars um, to build out some of their infrastructure. And then the last group um, is that advanced level. This is the well-established group, and this is where we're looking at building that networking and expanding it. How do we take what they've already learned and look at matching that with some to some federal opportunities. And I think this is one of the things we are really concentrating in in the governor's um, report that we wrote from the task forces. How do we build each of these levels and attract more dollars for Wisconsin through better networking? Next slide, please. Um, as we looked, at the governor's task force, as we looked at um, the different things that were out there, we looked at other states, we looked within, um, so some of the networks that were out there. These are some of the programs that were happening. We have a lot of 
of county committees that are happening around the state, um, community, communities, as well as county. Grow North, we're going to hear a little bit more about their broadband project and their art off readiness, as well as the nine region board um, with geo partners and some of the mapping. Uh, August is going to tell us a little bit more about how the network that they've developed has allowed them to use geo partners and do some very innovative things. Next slide, please. This is um, one of the key um, priorities that was identified by the Governor's Broadband Task Force. Um, and that's to establish a coalition of building broadband leaders that um, to connect communities, providers, local regional partners, technical planning, assistance opportunities, funding and resources. And in order to do that, we need leadership at the community, county, regional and state level. Next slide. And with that, I'd like to start to introduce our panel. We're very lucky to have three champions with us today that are going to describe different levels of that networking and leadership that are happening in the state. Our first panel me member today is going to be Bill Neiman. Bill is with the town of Boulder Junction. He's the vice chair of the Boulder Junction High Speed Broadband Expansion Committee. In 2019, Boulder Junction stakeholders made it crystal clear to the Economic Development and Connect Communities Committee and the town board that they need the town to invest in high-speed broadband to ensure a dynamic future for the town. Boulder Junction has galvanized around this project. The 83% sign-up rate for fiber to the premise serves um, premise service throughout the entire town demonstrates the need and the commitment of community to become a Northwoods Technology Center and redefine its future. I always look at Boulder Junction as one of our shining stars. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill. Okay, well, thank you, Gail, and you're, um, you're much too kind, but thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. So, uh, Kristen, if you would uh, go to the first slide. So, welcome to Boulder Junction, and uh, if you're not familiar, we are in far north central Wisconsin. Um, what's unique about our community is we have about a thousand full-time residents, seasonal residents, Pick a number. Could be between five and ten thousand. So we're very seasonal in nature, but we are growing, and 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 that's a key point. We have about two hundred lakes in our in our town, and uh, eighty-seven percent of our town area is owned by the state of Wisconsin. It's state forest, so very unique. It's a great place to come. Um, and really experience the North Woods of Wisconsin. So, uh, Kristen, if you go to the next slide, please. What I'm going to do here in a matter of a few minutes is boil three years, really four years of a project down into about four minutes. So let's uh, let's go. This really started for Boulder Junction. If you go back, Kristen, uh, this really started for Boulder Junction in 2017 when the Economic Development Committee uh, issued a survey. We needed some data. We needed a place to begin. Look at, look at it as a needs analysis. Question 11 is really the anchor of which we of which we use to springboard this project. And as you can see, the number one answer to what is the greatest economic challenge? The lack of internet. So that's where we started. Kristen, if you go ahead, please. All right, a lot of stuff on this slide and I'm gonna tell a bit of a story. So we had a bit of a gap, about a year gap between the results of the survey and getting started with this project. Really had no idea where we were going at the time. So we needed to educate ourselves. We started, we, there was a broadband work group of three that was an extension of the EDC. We had to educate ourselves, and then we had to educate our communities, starting with our town's leadership. And we met with them individually several, well, numerous times. 
We then had to go to our stakeholders and educate them. What are the options? We ended up walking to fiber, but we looked at all of the options that were available to us. We had 10 community information meetings in 2019 that included an electors meeting where the vast majority of electors voted for a project to take fiber optics, fiber optic high-speed broadband throughout the community. So this is a, a, a big project for us and we knew we had a big ask of the Wisconsin Public Service Commission. So we, we wrote, when it comes to the grants, we divided the project up into two phases and Boulder Junction wanted to kind of control its own destiny. So we wrote about 90% of the grant applications. Lumen Technologies, CenturyLink, who is our partner, wrote the technical pieces and the finance pieces and the strategy worked. $9 million for a project in a town is a big number. But, but here's a key point that I wanna leave with you because the Connect, Connect America funds, CAF and CAF2, get a lot of bad, um, a, a bad talk. If we didn't have CAF in the town of Boulder Junction, that $9 million project would have been about $11 million. So don't discount that fiber that's already been put into the ground with taxpayers dollars. It is a resource and however we can leverage it, we should leverage it. Uh, let's see, there were a number, there were a couple of other, um, of other inserts that didn't make it. But uh, so our partner is Lumen Technologies. They were a contributor to this. You can see Boulder Junction's investment. And the other thing that we've done and we continue to do is get private donations, private grants. We're very, very assertive in that area. <clears throat> All of this has been done through volunteers and the hours that we put into it thousands, thousands. So let's go to the next slide. Communication and marketing has been absolutely the key. We have just a phenomenal, just an unbelievably talented high-speed broadband committee, which has been, you know, the evolution that the, that the last slide addressed. Um, our whole goal here is to make this project successful. And our 83% sign up rate, I think is a, it's, it's a tribute to not only the leaders in the community, but the committee, but hey, let's face it, our stakeholders had to say, we support this project. And it's really about taking Boulder Junction to the next level and really re refining or redefining its future and moving from the tourist community, which will always be, but then moving it to a Northwoods idea community. So Kristen, let's go to the next slide. So this is our project. The project is to light up Boulder Junction in fiber optics, and we're in the process of doing that right now. We're in the project management stage of phase one uh, of the 1,347 living units, 745 are in phase one. Um, we are getting high-speed fiber service. Two packages are available, 200 over 200, or 940 over 940, that's almost a gag up and down for our community stakeholders. So we're very pleased about how this has gone and let's go to the next slide, Kristen. And I, Dr. Deller talked about how having access to high-speed broadband really impacts population growth and economic growth. So Boulder Junction is in Northwest Wisconsin, the star is highlighted. This is an area that had one of the highest population growth rates in the state. No question that our broadband project 
did have something to do with it. And the communities in Vilas County are very, very engaged as are others. So one more slide, Kristen. Our learnings. So don't be afraid, you can go in this direction, but every community is unique and one size fits all is not the approach. Look at what your stakeholders wanna do, take their feedback because at the end of the day, they're paying for this and we have to listen to those folks and then craft the right direction. So Gail, thank you, back over to you. Thank you, Bill. You you can see why Boulder Junction is one of our shining stars. Um, next, I'd like to move on to Marianne Lippert. And Marianne is a Wood County resident. She's also owner of Marianne Lippert Consulting. And Marianne is a Pittsville native who believes that small rural Wisconsin communities are the blessed, best places in the world to live, raise a family, work, and play. She learned this by traveling for six years through 40 Wisconsin counties, listening to residents and helping solve problems related to state government. Marianne enjoys working in her yard and woods, hanging out with her family and cheering for all of the Wisconsin sports teams. Heaven on Earth is Lambeau Field North End Zone. Um, with that, um, I really, think that Marianne is another one of our champions and I'm real excited for her to share how Wood County had, was one of the um, star communities at connecting resources and, and people. Marianne? Hey, hello friends. Thank you so much Gail and Extension for giving me the opportunity to talk about what's going on in really, really rural central Wisconsin. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the quote at the top of this slide. Well, the one on the bottom is also one that I try to live by um, and I echo um, Bill's thing about you can go fast because when you get the right people together and you've got a willing provider, things can happen really quickly. I do just want to mention real quick um, where I'm located today. Um, you know, I said I'm in rural Wisconsin, rural Wood County. Um, my internet speed, I have DSL at home and I pay for five download, 0.52 upload. That's the best I can get. A couple days ago, our panel did, um, did a little Zoom to get ready for this. My internet speed that day was 1.02 download and 0.09 upload. So today, even though I live only two miles from my community of Pittsville, um, I am at the Pittsville School District Administration Building because quite frankly, I did not trust my internet connectivity at home. It's just not reliable. So having said that, <laughs> let's go on to the next slide. First, I'm gonna start out with the Wood County experience and then move into what we were able to do in Jackson County. The whole thing really started with an email that I received from a town chair, someone that I used to run into at meetings who said, you know, Marianne, we have such bad internet access in our town. Can you help at all? Well, it came to the right person because I have bad internet access also. So what I ended up doing was um, calling some pals who are also frustrated with internet access. And we formed what I would call a skunk group. It wasn't um, sanctioned by any government. It was regular people that wanted to see a change. We did work with, um, we, we did invite some key people from county government, both a county elected county official and county staff to join our group so they could hear about our activities. The first thing we did was learn what other counties were doing. I called on some of my friends that I had 
from my, my travel days. And we learned how Kiwani County and Polk County approached this. Then in just a serendipitous situation, a provider contacted us, a fixed wireless provider who was very interested in what we were talking about and said, hey, we would love to work with you. So we promoted this, people and other government came on board. We ended up submitting two proposals to the PSC in December, 2020, both were funded. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the proposals. The first group that got together was really focused on the Southwest, very underserved area of Wood County. Uh, and it, it was the Pittsville School District. The Pittsville School District is 358 square miles. It covers, um, reaches into 12 different towns and actually into parts of four different counties. Extremely wooded, lots of cranberry bogs and very, very underserved. Um, we wrote one proposal that was specifically for the geography of the Pittsville School District. And a big piece of that geography goes into Jackson County. More about that later. The other application was for the rest of Wood County. We wanted to do two applications because we wanted to make sure that the most underserved area had a good chance at being funded and not necessarily mixing it in with other areas that also had issues, but didn't have unserved census blocks. Bottom line is they both got funded. One scored number four, the other scored number nine, and, um, and life was good. Next slide. So I said part of that geography included Jackson County. After the Pittsville School District slash Wood County proposal was funded, Jackson County contacted me and I started working with them. What we were able to do with Jackson County was really build on the things we learned in Wood County. First of all, county government did convene a multi-sector stakeholder group. The key thing they did was had citizen co-chairs not county government co-chairs, but citizen co-chairs. We issued a request for information. We re that request for information was sent to all the providers serving the county as well as those surrounding the county. Two proposals were submitted in the ARPA round. One was funded, one was not, but a core group continues to work. I mentioned the multi-sector, I mean, big multi-sector committee. What evolved from that was a small core group. There's um, seven people involved. And this core group is working on several things, educating town officials. Um, one town is already focused on a grant application. Uh, and we're doing that by going to individual town meetings. Um, also, the county is considering getting involved in speed testing. Also going to be issuing another request for information to providers to prepare for that next funding opportunity coming up from the PSC. Next slide, please. So what did we learn? First of all, don't wait for government to take the lead. Again, it goes back to the Margaret Mead quote, all it takes is a small group of committed people. Gather your pals. If government is the convener, use co-chairs from the community. The Jackson County co-chairs know everybody. Uh, <laughs> they're just fabulous to work with and they have the support of their employers to make this a priority. Um, meetings of multi-sector stakeholders are very important but sometimes it's hard to get things done with a large group of people. So at least in Jackson County, I believe that role of that small core group has enabled work to continue 
and continue in a very positive community, in a very positive manner. Um, communicate with your community. You know, I, I really um, like what Bill said about you can't over communicate. And there are so many assets that those of us who live in rural areas have, such as our weekly newspaper, the shopper, rate the local radio station, getting on with interviews, social media, and don't discount the service clubs, the Lions, the Rotary, the VFW, all those wonderful people. Next slide. A few other lessons. A willing provider is key. Um, you know, you can demonstrate need, but unless there's a provider that's willing to take the plunge and partner with you, you're not going to make headway. And reach out beyond the usual providers to assess interests that people on the edge of your service area may have in terms of expanding their service area. Data, public foundation, Public data really is the foundation and speed testing projects are great if you have the interest in the resources. But don't forget engaging local residents who are not at the meeting table. Um, we got speed test data in both counties by asking people for letters of support in which they would actually enclose speed test data and it worked. Also, letters of support tell your story in an extremely, extremely powerful way. Um, we were able to um, get a great amount of letters of support by using those local communication channels. Uh, last slide. You know, I'm always interested in chatting about working with rural communities. There's my contact information. Um, hope to reconnect with many of you and make some new friends along the way. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Marianne. I think you'll all agree that Marianne showed us some real life situations on how to make this work. It's networking. We've moved from the local community to the county to a couple counties looking at how they're going to work together in a region. And now what I'd like to look at is a more regional approach. Um, next, we have Barbara Koldas. Barbara is the Vice President of Business Development with New North. Um, she is serving as the Project Manager for New North Board Broadband Access Study and the Expansion Plan Project, a project that's partially funded by EDA. And the study will identify broadband access gaps and create a broadband implementation plan for each of 18 counties in the North, New North region. With that, that I'll turn it over to Barbara. Okay, Barbara, could we lose here? Yeah. Okay. Okay, it would, it would be helpful if I turned my mic on and turned my video on, so thank you. So sorry about there, that. There, great, thanks. <laughs> you could join us. No problem. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity. I look forward to sharing um, kind of where we've been, what we're doing and where we're going. So uh, next slide, please. I have two young children and this morning when they asked what I was doing today, they're seven and nine, um, I said I was doing a talk on broadband and internet. And I just wanted to share a quick joke that they said to me. They said, do you know how trees access the internet, mom? And I said, what? And they said, they just log in. So that's just a little brevity for the morning. <laughs> so just a quick level set. Um, what is the new North? Who are we? So uh, we heard this morning from Brittany, who's from Grow North. We're one of nine uh, regional economic development uh, organizations that are key strategic partners to WEDC, which is the state um, economic development group. Um, they, um, we represent 18 counties of Northeast Wisconsin. Um, and we know there's 72 counties in the state of Wisconsin. So we literally cover a fourth of the state. And uh, like Gail said earlier, I am the VP of Business Development for New North. And I serve currently as the project manager of our broadband access study and expansion plan. Uh, next slide, Peely. Thank you. So I don't need to go back and, you know, share where we've all been in the last year, year and a half. Um, but just 
giving an idea of where we came from, from a new from the New North's perspective, um, we all received the Safer at Home order in March of 2020. Um, and at that time, you know, we, we decided how do we continue to communicate with our 18 counties? You know, it's, it's a rather large region. So we started having biweekly huddles every, Friday, every other Friday at nine o'clock. Um, a group of us got together and kind of just shared stories, talked about where we've been, what we're doing. And, um, you know, one of the things that really happened throughout the pandemic and what we all heard all morning was it really shined a light on uh, the need for broadband. So we started asking what can be done? What can we do? Um, so we gathered a group um, together to create the first task force. And it was um, like Marianne had said earlier, it was a multi-sector group where we just really talked about, you know, what is it that we need to do? Um, it consisted of about individuals from associations representing public private sectors. There are about 20 or so individuals who are involved, um, some of whom are on this call right now. So thank you for your participation in that. Um, we decided that we needed to create a regional broadband gap analysis and plan for our 18 counties in anticipation for um, ARPA dollars, recovery dollars that we knew would be coming after uh, the pandemic. So we reached out to the EDA, learned that we can do um, an 80-20 match. So EDA funded us uh, $500,000 and we were able to then raise matching funds from um, Outagamie County Development and Land Services Department and a basic needs giving partnership between Greater Green Bay Community Foundation, the Community Foundation for the Fox Valley region, and the Oshkosh Area Community Foundations. Next slide, please. So what are we currently doing? So with the funding, we are creating a gap analysis. We're doing a gap analysis right now. Um, we sent out an RFQ um, and received six submittals. Um, we engage Design9, MSA, and GEO partners. Um, and it was really interesting earlier when um, one of the speakers talked about looking for unlikely partnerships. And I think it was Gail who, who mentioned that. Um, we actually did that. Uh, we engaged Design9 and MSA, um, but we also brought along GEO partners and brought them to the table. So we kind of married the three companies together, um, knowing that GEO partners working with Brown County, which is in our region, uh, with the speed tests. So um, we had, a, we convened the three companies. And then from there, we had an 18 county top official round table to introduce our consultants, um, started talking about um, how do we engage um, our partners. So we held community meetings. In fact, there were two or three that have happened so far. We sent paper surveys to all of our households, um, as well as online surveys. And thank you, Gail, for sharing the link to our site. Um, and then concurrently, as the surveys were happening, um, GIS mapping was occurring. So as you can see from the slide, these are just the various ways. And again, to reiterate what Marianne said earlier, right? Using what's available to your specific community. Sometimes it's paper mailers, Sometimes it's social media, sometimes it's radio ads. But the key is to continuously keep our partners engaged and informed. And we continue to do that through the, the bi-weekly huddles that we do. All right, next slide, please. So our results so far, uh, Gail shared uh, the link to our New North site. And I actually pulled up um, the live results map. Um, and if you look at that map, if you have a chance to, to, to click on that link, there's been over 20,000 speed tests done within our region. And you can see by that, that map that we have right there. I mean, that's impressive. And that's just our tiny region. So um, next slide, please. So our next steps is uh, we hope to have this gap analysis and implementation plan completed for each of our 18 counties by December 31st and have speed tests uh, lit up for the entire state of Wisconsin. And that's it for me, next slide. And that's my contact information. I look forward to seeing how I can help or assist or 
be a part of your plans. Thank you. Thanks so much. I think you can see how the networking and leadership builds that foundation for successful projects. And we really appreciate being able to see some of the real world networking that's going on out there. And um, look forward to now some of the details and how we can move forward with some of these projects. So with that, we'll turn it back to you, Kristen. Thank you, Gail. And thank you very much to Bill, Marianne, and Barbara for spending time with us today and sharing your information. It's very exciting uh, to see what's happening out in Wisconsin and what we're capable of doing. So next up is another panel discussion on mapping data and surveying. This panel is being moderated by Matt Curis, Community Development Experience. By Community Economic Development Specialist at the Division of Extension, UW-Madison. Um, Matt is known to a lot of us. He has extensive experience working with communities and organizations across the state in areas of regional economic analysis, labor force research, socioeconomic impact analysis, and industry sector competitiveness, and of course, broadband access. Matt will moderate and introduce our next panel. So over to you, Matt. Great, thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, improving broadband access and digital equity requires knowing which households and businesses are unserved or underserved. Unfortunately, there is not a comprehensive resource that details broadband availability or adoption. And several of the resources that do exist have notable limitations. However, a number of data sets and strategies are available to communities to help them identify and quantify their areas of need. Our next session will share several mapping data and survey examples that can assist in broadband development efforts across the state. I will start by describing a number of public data sources and tools that are available to communities and organizations. Next, we will hear from August Neverman, who is the Brown County Broadband and Brown County Community, Community Area Network Director. Uh, August will talk to us this morning about speed test broadband mapping efforts in Brown County and Northeast Wisconsin. Finally, my colleague, Barry Hotman, who is a community development educator with the Division of Extension, will discuss broadband survey work in Iowa County. Uh, to, to get us started this morning, uh, I will spend some time talking about broadband data sources. And when I talk about broadband data sources, as I mentioned before, I'm talking about those that are available to the public. And one data source that I'm not talking about today is providers. And I think a lot of communities when they're first looking at data sources to understand broadband availability, they, they should try and work with their providers to understand uh, gaps in coverage. And a lot of communities across the state have had success in working directly with providers to provide this information. So that is one resource to start with. Uh, next slide, please. But of those that are available to the public, I think one that many communities have accessed uh, in the past is the FCC broadband map. And the FCC broadband map is based on Form 477 data, which is submitted by providers, which asks them a number of questions in terms of uh, the, the areas they cover, the types of technologies they provide, as well as the types of speeds available to households or businesses in a given area. And the FCC data, the 477 data, is available at the census block level, which is the smallest enumeration unit that the Census Bureau uses. And unfortunately, in a lot of instances, it's not as granular as we would like, but nonetheless, it is a starting point for understanding the types of coverage and availability uh, available in many geographies across the state. And this information, as you will see, can be aggregated to other geographies, such as places and counties. Uh, the map, which you see the link there, as well as just shared in the chat, uh, you can enter an address, you can enter an area, it'll take you to that area, and it will show you the number of providers that are available, uh, who the providers are, their upload and download speeds, and you can also filter by different technologies, so if you just want to look at those that are providing cable or fiber or fixed wireless, you can do that, and it'll also allow you to filter by upload and download speeds. One of the notable problems with the FCC data is that it overestimates coverages in almost every instance. So the rule is that if a provider can serve one household in a census block, then that entire census block is considered to be served. And we know in many instances that is not the case. 
One of the other challenges with this data set is that it is the maximum advertised speed, not necessarily the actual speed that a household gets. So in a lot of instances, we may have uh, an idea that we have access to a certain speed, but in reality, those speeds may be very different for what a household receives. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another map that's very useful for a lot of communities is from the Wisconsin Broadband Office, the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin. And this is a map that I think a lot of communities will go to before they go to the FCC broadband map because it takes a lot of the FCC data and supplements it with some submitted provider data. And it also filters the data in a lot of different ways that I think is more uh, useful to communities in terms of how they think about access. There's different coverage layers for wired or wireless or mobile access. There's also additional information on individual, individual providers that are available in a given geography. Uh, one of the, the features that I think are really useful is the ability to map a specific county. So with the FCC broadband map, it's really hard to create a high quality map that you can insert into a grant application or some other type of document. And the uh, Wisconsin broadband map allows you to do that and export and print it in a variety of formats. Uh, next slide, please. Now to get around some of the issues with the FCC data, we can also look at the US Census Bureau's American Community Survey. And what this is, is actually asking individuals whether or not they have broadband access of a given type uh, and not based on whether or not the infrastructure is available. So the ACS data provides estimates of internet and broadband access by total households and population. And they also break it down by different demographic characteristics. Uh, a number of those that Steve covered earlier on in the, uh, in the summit. So we can look at access in terms of income, in terms of race and ethnicity. We can look at it in terms of age and it gives us some better insights into whether or not households of different types do or do not have access. Now the interface for the American Community Survey data is not always the easiest to use. Uh, so one of the things I've done here is to uh, list some table numbers that may be of interest for you in terms of different internet access characteristics. So if you just simply take one of those numbers and enter it into the search, you can pop up different characteristics in terms of internet subscriptions and uh, other types of uh, uh, data sets on availability. You can do it by different geographic levels, so county, place, census tract, and so on and so forth. And it also includes an estimate of margin of error to give you an idea of, of how uh, good the estimate may be. Uh, next slide, please. Just a couple of ways that we've used this data to, to look at access across the state of Wisconsin. And these are the two maps that Steve showed earlier, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them but certainly using the FCC data to look at where uh, households may have higher or low shares of, of access to um, broadband using the 25-3 definition, and certainly looking at the census blocks that have no access to broadband of, of any type. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned before, we can use the American Community Survey data to help supplement some of this information. So here, the map on your left, we're looking at the share of census tract households without a broadband subscription. And we can compare that to the prior maps showing the FCC distributions to say maybe there's some areas that uh, that match up very well in terms of their availability, but those that might show some sort of disconnect. And I'll go into that just a little bit more here in a second. As Steve mentioned earlier as well, we also look at uh, internet access based on different household incomes. And this map on your right looks at census tract households that have a household income of $75,000 or more, which tend to typically have higher levels of access. These are ones without a broadband subscription. So again, this might provide some insights into where those areas are that lack sufficient uh, internet access, regardless of what the FCC data show. Next slide, please. And a lot of times we can use this information in combination to help provide additional insights. What this map does is take the FCC data and combines it with the American Community Survey data and looks at the share of households with access to broadband according to the FCC versus the share of households without a broadband subscription according to the American Community Survey. Those areas you see in teal are those that are um, those are census tracts that show low access to broadband according to the FCC and also have a high share of households without a subscription according to the ACS. So those kind of match up. That's what we'd expect in a lot of rural areas, areas that may not have the infrastructure they need to provide service. 
We also have a lot of those kind of dark maroon or plum areas that you see on the map. Those are areas that suggest high access according to the FCC data, but also tend to show high uh, shares of households without a subscription. Those are areas where there may be a mismatch in terms of what the FCC data show, in terms of its reliability, but it also may be areas where there's low adoption. So it may be areas where we have higher uh, shares of households that have lower income. It may be um, households may not understand what the uh, access to the internet can actually do to them, do for them. So again, these types of maps provide different perspectives in terms of what we're trying to accomplish in our community. Uh, next slide, please. Just real quickly, a couple additional data sets and sources that are that are useful um, in understanding indicators of need in this instance. This is the National Telecommunications and Information Administration Indicators of Broadband Need Map. There's a variety of different resources here looking at uh, households reporting no internet access without a device. That we have speed test data from Ookla and NLAB. Connection speeds from Microsoft that look at whether or not uh, Microsoft de devices that are doing updates in terms of software or operating systems are receiving those updates from uh, a broadband connection, as well as some other information on high poverty census tracts and eligible minority serving institutions under the NTIA's Connecting Minority Grants Community Grants Program. Uh, next slide. Just a couple additional resources. Uh, Michigan State has what's called the Broadband Integrated Time Series data set. And this looks at how internet access has and broadband access has changed over time by census tract using the FCC data. Uh, speed test data from MLAB, Ookla, as well as some local and regional efforts. You just heard from Barbara and the efforts in New North, and you'll hear from August here in a second and what they're doing in, in Brown County. Some survey information in terms of broadband accessibility. You'll hear an example again here from Barry in Iowa County in a minute. Uh, one of the data sets I find really useful is a statewide parcel data set. And I'll show you an example of that here in a second, uh, combined with some of the other uh, uh, internet access information to really look at a more granular level in terms of where places may or may not be served. And then Broadband Now also, also has their own national broadband map, map as well as some information on zip code, um, uh, internet pricing by zip code. Next slide, please. Just an example here of how the state uh, parcel data can be combined with uh, internet access information from the FCC. Uh, those census tracts that you see, or census blocks, excuse me, you see in orange there, that supposedly is an area not covered by uh, broadband access around Columbus Lake and Oneida County. And you'll see all those parcels there that supposedly do not have access. So if we can use this information in tandem with the parcel information, we can identify perhaps clusters of areas that, that may not be served and reach out to those individuals to say, hey, you know, maybe there's an opportunity for us to work together to gain access to broadband on your property. Uh, next slide. That's my contact information. I know some of these data sets can be a little bit tricky to use sometimes, and I'm happy to try and walk you through um, using some of these resources going forward. I'm, I'm happy to do so. Uh, but in the interest of time, uh, I would like to now give the floor to August Neverman, the Brown County Broadband and Brown County Community Area Network Director, who will discuss their efforts to test and map broadband availability. Uh, August, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, next slide. We'll jump right in. Can everybody hear me all right? Yep, good. All right, so we started the role um, broadband subcommittee um, almost exactly a year ago, but we started with broadband in early 2009 with the Brown County Community Area Network. So that was a municipal fiber network. Um, the fact that we had that fiber in the ground kind of led us towards a county model where we discussed broadband from a countywide perspective rather than trying to solve individual problems. So that committee was formed. We've been meeting with townships, with villages. Um, this is primarily a township problem. So I just have this map up because it gives you a good idea where we don't have service or the service is poor. So by federal definition, all the red is underserved. So all of our Eastern and Southern parts of, of the county are underserved. Um, to get this map data, um, we kind of fell into an opportunity for a uh, free year of the, um, the GeoPartners 
um, speed test mapping and took advantage of it. And then we did a media blitz. We did QR codes, that sort of thing. And I'm going to explain that a little bit in a second. We got on TV interviews, um, county executives spoke. We went to the school boards. We went to pretty much everybody we possibly could to get um, the information out. Next slide. So we created a web page and started out. It did not, originally did not have that broadband affordability. Um, option over on the far right of those buttons. Um, this is that if you go to the um, browncountywi.gov broadband, we did a, a vanity URL to dump it so that it would um, they did not have to know the really long URL to the sub page. Um, but we, they could take the speed test. They could find out what we're up to. They can find the current maps. They can see what does speeds mean. So that was another challenge is just the plain education piece of this. Then over under the um, what are others doing, we link every time we find something interesting somewhere else in the, uh, the, the US or specifically in Wisconsin, we add in there. So when I get the information from um, the, the deck from this meeting, I'm going to be adding more content inside of the what are we doing or what are others doing. And then the broadband affordability um, has been creeping up in terms of priority. Our committee has emphasized the need for that. Next slide. This is where it's map, map geek, geek land. Um, this map, our GIS guy created and made it so we can select boxes on the right to turn layers on and off. Um, one of the most interesting layers we added on was population density. And for a lot of providers, as much as you'd think they have this information available, they probably don't. Well, in fact, I know they don't in certain cases. So this map data, especially for small providers or providers that are really large who don't know about the local area, this was extremely valuable to those providers to the point that some providers actually provided services based on the map without us even being in, involved with it. So they just knew they had fiber near a location and they started providing services. Now that's only in two spots in the county, so I can't claim great success, but it did happen. It's also making it easier for um, going forward. This was built off of county GIS data and was customized just for um, the discussion of broadband. And it's got two layers, to, two um, parts to it. One is kind of the municipal side of the world. How do we handle government for government? How do we handle schools? How do we handle basic public institutions? And that purple network is all of our fiber. That purple network and the proposed red network, which is very expensive, um, is also available to utilities. So this makes it possible for a utility if they want to lease or a thing called an IRU, they can IRU or long-term lease fiber from us at very low cost. So our hope is, is that we're going to be able to facilitate um, additional development. So the map acts as a method to communicate information. Um, we are through other things on here like business parks, you name it, school districts. Um, we can slice and dice the data, turn layers on and off. Next slide, please. So what it, what did it do? Um, the the advantage of the map is, is it gives us real data. So if you remember, there was green and red dots all over the place. Well, the green and red dots tell you what the the actual speed for that individual at that time was or what they're reporting if they say it's black so when we get to some of the maps farther down you'll notice that some of those areas have black dots and then they're surrounded by red and green that means it's pretty likely it's a financial problem so we have good data but the data may not represent what what we think it is so it's a you got to communicate what that data set is um, we were surprised. We figured we were going to see a lot more green above 100 meg because we can slice and dice the data. Um, we didn't find as much as we expected. We also were surprised with the large amount of 25 of areas that were below 25.3. So the feds say pretty much the whole county is covered. If you go by the census block, we're, we're gold. Everybody has, you know, gig or 100 meg. Not exactly. As an example, I'm in Kiwani County. I was also part of the Kiwani County broadband uh, project. And my location says I have 70 meg or 75 meg available to me. 
my DSL link has an up uh, download of around five on a good day and around 0.9 on a good day. Uh, most days I'm around three and about 0.5. That's not 75. <laughs> And I can't do anything about it. Uh, my, my wife runs a business. I want to be able to get service. So we hear this type of stuff over and over. She offers 20 grand to all the local providers. Nobody will touch us. So even with willing, willing to throw money at it. So this map helps us then to go backwards to, to for grants, um, to go to the, those providers and say, hey, you say you have 75. There's not even one person in your entire area that's showing 75. We get that they might have been while watching Netflix or something, but we have a thousand samples and not one of them is green. What's up? So this gives us a way to have conversations with uh, providers that We've talked with school districts about the school side of this. Um, of course, I already mentioned the affordability. So it also, with because of the layers, we can mix the population data with the sample data, which is very useful to the providers because they care about how much money they can make. So if we have weird little spots on maps that gives us um, locations where there's clusters of homes that a provider may not be aware of, that might lure them to do development in that location. Um, We've used the data already for um, the state PSC grant. Unfortunately, we didn't get it, but we will be applying again. We've used that data to share with other providers who have applied for um, NTIA, and others will be making joint proposals um, for ARPA at the county and at municipal levels, because some of that money is at the township level. And then um, we're actually working with power utilities also. So this has really kind of opened up the number of people who are at the table. Next slide, please. So these two, man, I'm gonna actually gonna say, go to the next slide and then we're gonna go back. So go to the next slide, please. So on the left, you see where Brown County was in September. Then more broad broadband um, communications, um, the new North region did their handout. Barb Coldis and her folks, got that communication out. Troy got on TV, Troy's our county executive. Um, so there was a lot of media. So you can quickly see on the left where it started out with just a small amount around Brown County. Then we got much better in the region that also helped out Brown County. So now let's go back up again. Back slide, yep. You can see that it just kept getting better and better. So by November 4th, and you can, the one Barb shared was even newer, we, we have really good sample data now. We've got over 20,000 samples in, in Brown County. The provider can also add overlay OCLA and some other Microsoft data so we can really slice and dice that data. But fundamentally, so let's go forward to now, two slides, please. Yep. So fundamentally what's left? Well, the New North Regional Broadband Study is gonna give us additional backend data. That's one of the challenges with just doing speed. Um, if, if I just took the speed test from the, the house I'm living in right now, it would see, okay, you, you've got five meg down, point something up, and you've got a second link that's through a uh, wireless point-to-point -point provider, and you're getting almost 25 meg, you're covered, you're good. You don't need anything, you know, you're, you're, you're fine. But the survey data is gonna say, oh, by the way, that person's trying to do live streaming video from multiple feeds because they have an online business. That's a little different data set and a little bit of informa different information, whether you're talking to a provider or trying to go for grants or talking with a community. It, that, that little bit of extra information is gonna make a huge difference. So that's where the, the survey part um, maps up to the, spe the speed test part of it. Um, we've been very happy with the high partic participation rates because of the direct mailings and the TV and social media blitzes. Um, that regional data we're hoping we can get comparable to what we've seen in Brown County. Um, all boats rise with rising water, so we want to try to get the entire region up. Um, and there's a link again to the New North Broadband Access, and next slide. And I'm done. <laughs> Any questions? Well, thank you.
Great. Uh, thank you so much, August. I, I think you've really shown the importance of having good local data and what that can really do for communities to help them understand um, gaps in coverage. And even where you have coverage, it may not be sufficient for a lot of uses. And um, communities really need to know that and make that case going forward. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce our final panelist, uh, Barry Hotman, who is Extension's Community Development Educator in Iowa County. And Barry will be sharing some recent broadband survey work and the insights gained from this effort. And I think this really builds upon some of the comments we just heard about really having those nuances in understanding access. Uh, Barry. Thanks, Matt. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Next slide, please. So as Matt was saying, uh, about September of 2020, uh, Iowa County government and uh, with working with Extension uh, decided we should do a, a broadband survey. My predecessor, community development predecessor in 2017 had done a broadband survey in Iowa County. And we felt that it was important to use some of the questions and uh, questions asked in the 2017 survey and build upon it in this 2020 survey so that we could have data points that we could build off of and compare. Uh, so Iowa County is about 24,000 people. Uh, we sent out 6,653 paper surveys in September. It was late September, uh, hoping that we'd get uh, close the survey roughly around the first part of November. Um, we knew that uh, we had a target rich environment with everyone, you know, Certainly at home during the pandemic, uh, we felt that we might be able to get away with a little bit longer survey, trying to ask a few more detailed questions. And with uh, broadband certainly being in the spotlight during the time when everyone's sitting at home, uh, we felt that people would be ready to uh, provide feedback on their, on their level of service and, and what they felt about the, their need and access in the future. So we had about 1,350 survey responses out of that. So roughly about 20% survey response rate, which we thought was awesome. And uh, there are some examples. Uh, hopefully, Gail will share resources. I, I'm, I provided links to all the surveys that I created. This is not confidential information. Certainly feel free to look at them and ask any questions um, down the road. Um, but we used uh, a lot of different ways to market the survey. We did a paper survey that we sent out. That was our way of letting people know along with doing some articles in local newspapers, some press releases, uh, Facebook uh, marketing. And we also reached out to the local school district and asked them to send out correspondence uh, to the parents of the students in the school district, letting them know that the survey was coming, uh, letting them know that it was important that we you know, received as much feedback as possible. Um, some of the things that we asked for in the, in the survey were certainly uh, demographics and, and what type of access you have to broadband, uh, the type and costs associated with the service that you have where you're at, um, and what you use your broadband for. But uh, one thing that we thought was important was, and this was due to conversations that we had with internet service providers, was um, as, as you look at the rural landscape, and certainly as you look at trying to provide maybe fiber to the home access in rural areas. Um, it's different than being in, in your urban areas where you know, the length from the, from the road to where the, where the fiber may be at to the person's house is probably similar from street to street. You get out in the rural areas and you certainly have some long driveways that you're trying to reach as, you're, as you try to provide fiber to the home access. So in talking with local providers, they had asked if, um, you know, we could survey and find out people's willingness to pay for maybe one-time setup fees. Um, you know, would you pay $250? Uh, August kind of alluded to it that uh, his wife had a, has a home-based business and was willing to pay $20,000 maybe to put fiber to the home or better internet access at their house. And that's exactly what we were trying to gauge is understand, is there a willingness to pay a one-time fee because so many people want this type of access, whether they have a home-based business, whether they have children at home that are trying to do virtual learning, or whether they have a college student that's looking to, or them themselves as, as professionals trying to um, get, a, get another degree or further their education. Next slide, please. 
So why the survey? I talked about the current situation. Obviously, there's opportunities for improvement in the rural, rural landscape. If you don't know where Iowa County is, we're just west of Dane County in the southwest corner of the state. Um, certainly have a, a large uh, rural contingency. And certainly, as Matt alluded in, in the data, we knew the FCC data was, was maybe underestimating the amount of uh, good broadband access and affordable access that we had. And therefore, we needed to find out that uh, what, what the true picture was. And it was critical to provide that information to local providers if we were wanting them to make investments in our area. So certainly use this information for looking at grants, for talking with partners, and, and so forth. Uh, but really so many other reasons, the education and the learning, the telecommuting from work, uh, telemedicine, hopefully here in the future, uh, people's mental health, uh, the inability to access the internet, certainly during the pandemic, I think was certainly a, a critical uh, uh, challenge for people's mental health because of the, the lack of connectivity to the world and certainly the economic development capabilities that uh, uh, better broadband access can bring to uh, a, an area, whether it's a county or municipality. Next slide, please. So some of the results, I'm not gonna uh, weigh too heavy on this, but uh, it was that's why we had kind of used some of the questioning from the 2017 survey that I talked about earlier, so that we had some comparisons. So I kind of highlighted a few of them. 90%, 92% of the respondents stated the internet is extremely to very important. Only 64% of those responded that way in 2017. 43% uh, said that they were somewhat to extremely dissatisfied with their available services. Uh, going back to the willingness to pay, 27% uh, would be willing to pay 81 to over $100 per month as compared to only 10% of those in 2017. And 92% uh, said yes or maybe regarding a willingness to pay a one-time installation fee. And 51% of those said they would pay anywhere from $250 to over $1,000 to get better broadband access at their, at their residence. Next slide, please. Some of the other results continue, talked about the need of, of people wanting to start home-based businesses in the future. Certainly the need to be able to telecommute. Um, there was 14 pages of additional comments and I'll tell you that was uh, certainly eye-opening looking at uh, all the different comments. Certainly again, the spotlight was on broadband during, during the pandemic. So it was kind of uh, a, a perfect storm, if you will. And the comments were certainly uh, good information to be able to share with providers, share with uh, county leaders, and to help everyone understand the need for, for better broadband. And we also asked if people were interested. We didn't have it identified on how they may be able to help, but we wanted them to, to express interest if they were interested to help us. Out of those 1,350 respondents, 594 of them were interested in, find, in helping us uh, find solutions to, to broadband access in Iowa County. Next slide, please. So what did we find? Obviously, like everyone has been talking about, it's not good in our rural areas. Uh, we need to be committed to improving it. Uh, much like August was showing with their, their mapping tool, we had, we had reached out to Southwest Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission, which is, covers six counties in Southwest Wisconsin. They used Iowa County to create a GIS resource and similar to all the layers that August talked about on, on their GIS resource, we did the same thing. And then we mapped as well survey data from 2017, as well as mapped our data that we collected from our 2020 uh, broadband survey. So lots of information that we were able to then give to uh, local providers to help them identify areas um, where there was certainly a need for better access. Um, you know, it's a, not a one size fits all solution. And what I mean by that is that uh, there's certainly a lot of fixed wireless uh, solutions out there. It's not an ideal scenario, but many of those fixed wireless solutions are all that's available in some areas, especially in our rural, rural areas. And finding ways to, uh, you know, if we had 30 million or 50 million for Iowa County, we certainly could provide fiber to the home to every address, but we can't come up with 50 million right out of the gate. But we can work with getting grants and, and smaller projects, 
that can provide fiber to the home and, and provide fiber in other areas that may also help provide better options in fixed wireless. So if a fixed wireless installation is being backfed by microwave and now has a fiber line directly to that tower, we can then increase the speeds and, and opportunities for those being serviced by that fixed wireless installation. It's not the end all. We certainly want fiber to the home, but it certainly is a step in the right direction and certainly a more affordable option in the, in the, in the interim. And I'd say it's going to take a committed effort. You know, the strategic partners, Gail talked about uh, relationship building, and that's truly what it is. It's a public-private relationship that needs to be made between the, the local providers, uh, obviously county government, but also municipalities and, and their, their governance, healthcare, education, business, and industry. It's that out-of-the-box thinking that it's going to take obviously dollars that I just talked about in the financial support and taking the time to work on grants and planning. Next slide, please. I'll go past this, but- uh, uh, One Steve minute left, and, Barry. And Tessa had, had, what's that? One minute left. Okay. Steve and Tessa had talked about the, the survey that, or excuse me, the study that they had done. You can go next slide. So what do we learn? Uh, obviously, I would, I would change some things in the survey. If people have questions about the survey I created, like I said, it's not confidential. I'll gladly share things that I've learned from it and things that I would change. Um, certainly more education prior to the survey. Uh, the key was is really the building of the relationships. Uh, with all the money that's being uh, sent uh, maybe through this uh, infrastructure bill, I think it was $65 billion that might be put towards uh, broadband, um, having the term shovel ready projects, working with your internet service providers so that you've already identified projects that you can apply for grants and, and get some of that funding. It requires uh, that public partner relationship. So having that commitment by the county, commitment by townships, municipalities, uh, and plan ahead. Next slide. That's it. If you have any questions, there's my contact information. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, thanks, Barry. And, and thank you again, August. And, and I hope that all of you have seen that, you know, even though some of the public data sets aren't ideal, there are a number of approaches that communities can use to better understand uh, coverage and where those gaps are. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to turn it back over to Kristen to introduce our, our next panel. But if any of you do have questions, I would encourage you to contact us or submit them in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, August, Barry, and Matt. And after we're officially finished today, we are going to keep the channel open a little longer in case people want to hang around and, and chat. But uh, we're going to turn uh, the floor over to Chris Stark for our next panel. And our final panel today is on funding broadband access. And this panel, as I said, will be moderated by Chris Stark. Chris is a community development educator in Forest County and is a broadband specialist extraordinaire. Uh, Chris has conducted some specialized research on improving broadband capacity in rural Wisconsin and coordinated broadband access and digital inclusion efforts with several state and regional groups, including his work with the newly formed Wisconsin Digital Equity and Inclusion Stakeholders Group. Um, he's also helped support broadband access grants for rural Wisconsin. And Chris will moderate and introduce the next panel. Over to you, Chris. I th thank you so much, Kristen, for that very, very, very kind introduction. And I see my panel is all, all four are here and ready to go. And so funding broadband access has certainly been a problem for rural communities, hence the reason that so many of you are here today. This is where the sparser population makes return on investment a particular challenge. Today, to address the funding issue, we will hear first from two rural counties in their efforts to acquire broadband, that being Kiwani County and Taylor County. Then we will hear from Melissa Kenny, Public Service Commission and the Wisconsin Broadband Office on state and federal funding efforts, and from Tom Barron of the Economic Development Administration. Barb Coldus referenced that grant and what they're doing in New North and what the EDA is doing and continues to do to fund broadband projects. Uh, please hold all questions to the end of this panel. And our first speaker I want to jump right into as we're a couple minutes uh, uh, late here, a couple minutes behind the time here, is Scott Felt, 
County Administrator of Kewanee County and Scott, are you ready to uh, take the floor? I am, Chris. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you all for attending and giving me the opportunity to talk to you about uh, what has happened in Kewanee County. I like to call it our Kewanee County Broadband Blueprint. Um, so the best way to do this is to kind of give a broadband timeline as to what has happened in Kewanee County. Uh, we first started, well, I, I started in Kewanee County as administrator back in 2015. And one of the first things that I heard from businesses, residents, anyone that wanted to bend my ear had to be about broadband. And so after getting, uh, getting my feet under me and knowing where the bathroom was, I started to check and see where, where uh, we could do some things. And so we started having some conversations with uh, Door County Broadband and the Public Service Commission and putting in broadband expansion grants. And as you can see, our, our first time around, we didn't really, uh, we put in a grant and didn't work. Then we tried it in 18, we got a little bit of money. 18, again, nothing. And I think part of the reason why is because we as a county uh, weren't committing, I guess is how I would say it financially. So what we did is as administrator, I proposed putting a million dollars into the 2019 budget, which was a large amount of money, but I thought it was a great way to show the county's commitment towards broadband. Now the county board was a little concerned because we didn't have a project or a provider identified. So they said, uh, we're gonna take that money out until you do that. And with that also the county board chair then created a broadband study committee, which included a number of county board supervisors, our economic development corporation, school district, uh, some businesses and other local officials. So we met monthly throughout the uh, year of 2019 and Around October, around fall, we put out an RFP for a broadband partner. Uh, we had five responses to our RFP and Bug Tussle Wireless was selected. <clears throat> we immediately then um, submitted a broadband expansion grant of which we were awarded 960,000 on a $2.5 million project. The next year we put in again for that 1.4 out of a 4 million. Uh, we just put in two, and then this year, we put in two applications, one with Bug Tussle and one with Charter Spectrum. Uh, those were not awarded, but we do have one federal uh, grant that is still being considered. So when we look at the, the grant application from 2019, that was towers. And if we look at the map of the towers, that was a connection, next slide, thanks Lori, is if we look, what that would be is you would have a number of towers that were going to be built and within the county and then some were co-locations. Uh, the thought was with those co-locations and building of new towers, we would be able to cover roughly almost 90% of the county. So we first started to do the towers we have uh, most of those up and a few co-locations that are still waiting, but that has been moving forward. So then the next um, grant application that we big, did with Bug Tussle had to do with putting fiber to those towers. Uh, that was, next slide. Um, what that would do is put fiber to those towers, which would help with the speed as well as the uh, width bandwidth that could be done. So we tried to look at that. And then finally, we just put in an application with Charter Spectrum to try to uh, provide a fiber to the home of all unserved areas. That's the next slide. And hopefully if that can be done, that would basically cover almost all of the rural areas. So we're looking to hear from that federal uh, grant. Hopefully we'll find out in roughly a week whether that would happen. 
So with that, we tried to look at, next slide please. What's next? Well, we continue to look at uh, grants to be doing. Yes, we will submit a grant. Uh, as you know, the PSC just announced that in December, they're gonna be sending information regarding the next round of broadband expansion grants. And of course, we will be uh, trying to take advantage of that. So with the next slide, we talk about what are funding sources. Well, funding sources really come down to three different things. They either come down to cash that you have, grants that you can, that you can obtain, or loans. This is just a, a small sample of federal grants that are available. Next slide. So what we did for our, from, from the Kiwani County standpoint is we as a county or a small rural county, which does not have a large tax base, therefore the ability, sorry, thank you, is uh, the ability to provide uh, financing for these projects. With, we wouldn't have the cash per se, so we put together a loan agreement. And so for the $960,000 with Bug Tussle, that is a 12 year loan at 3% interest. And so uh, what that does, and we had signed that back in 2020, uh, we're signing the contract with Bug Tussle for the fiber project. That will be $2.2 million at an interest rate of 3%. Now, through both of these agreements, what will happen is Kiwani County will have, <clears throat> will provide uh, improved broadband accessibility without any cost to the taxpayer. Next slide. So what are the next steps for us? The next steps is we will continue to review Bug Tussle and a couple of programs that they have. They have their um, road program, which provides a uh, county bonding authority, which allows Bug Tussle to be able to access those bond funding. And with that, the county would receive a bundle of fibers as well as tower space for our public safety use, as well as we would receive uh, interest income from that since those that funding would be paid back. We're also uh, looking to have conversations with our towns to do last mile. And again, uh, Bug Tussle is looking at something where if the towns provide the ARPA funding as a match that they will install fiber and that the towns would receive a percentage of those revenues uh, for an agreed amount of time and agreed amount as well. And therefore, this would allow us to uh, expand our, our accessibility. We've been lucky that with Bug Tussle, what that has done is that has now uh, been a catalyst for other providers to come in, whether that's Charter Spectrum, whether that is Ensite Cellcom. Uh, what that has done is now these other providers are also wanting to come into the county and do projects and do it in an affordable way for our, our localities, our municipalities, and eventually bring back broadband accessibility for the county, which is important to us because with the broadband uh, now survey that, that uh, New North has done, actually broadband access of the 18 counties, Kiwani County has the lowest percentage. So this is just one way for us to do it and make the best use of the, of the county dollars that we have. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very Thank you much, Scott. Much. So much appreciated. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Right. Yeah, I was talking Thanks. a little fast. I apologize. Oh, no, that, that's, that's fine. But let me now introduce, uh, I'll take it right over to uh, Mike Bubb. Mike is on. Mike is the chairperson of the Taylor County Broadband and a Taylor County Supervisor. Mike, are you ready? Yes, I am, thank you very much. First of all, um, thank you to the UW Extension for putting this together. I, I wish I would have seen this presentation two years ago when we were starting our project because a lot of great information, so thank you. So uh, next slide so we can get right into it. Uh, next slide. <laughs> 
Well, I don't see my presentation. <laughs> oh, Mike, sorry. We thought you were going to wing this since you didn't have any PowerPoint slides. Oh. Do you have the uh, do you have your your presentation with you in person? Uh, no, I didn't print it out because I thought it was going to be here, but I can just do it. Um, Taylor yeah, County. Sure. Um, we started about three years ago. I'm a Taylor County Board Supervisor. When I was first elected, um, I was foolish enough to open my mouth and say that Taylor County needs more help on their broadband. And we, uh, you know, when we looked at the maps from the PSC, we, uh, we actually are one of the second, we're the second worst county in the state for broadband service to our community. Um, when the pandemic hit and they shut down the schools, we have three school districts that are within our county, five other school districts that just have some students in the edge of our county. Um, education didn't slow down for 30% of our students, it stopped. They had no access to the internet. And so they had, education was over. And so um, I went to the Taylor County Board and we, and we talked about it. And um, we have 17 county, county board members all county board supervisors approved a $9.5 million loan to build a, a middle mile network. We formed a committee that had done research. We uh, looked at counties all over the nation. We looked at places in Idaho, Minnesota, Ohio, Iowa, to see what people were doing. And the problem is with Taylor County being a very rural county, we have the city of Medford with 4,500 people. Our county population is about 22,000 people. Um, we realized very quickly that um, while TDS and Charter both service Medford, the city of Medford very well, outside of the city, they're really not interested in going there because we average four customers per mile. And four customers per mile doesn't do it for them. They, they can't make money. And so we looked at the options and one of the options was to build a network that ISP providers could build off of. And so uh, the county board, <laughs> to my surprise, voted 17 to nothing to borrow this money and build a network. So we're in the process of building our network right now that will connect 32 different county sites. All of our, our major school districts, our libraries, and uh, town halls, village halls, and the county buildings will all be connected by the end of the year and they'll have one gigabyte service via fiber. Um, the plan is then, and is what we're doing right now, is that we're, we did an RFP for um, get other internet service providers now to come to Taylor County and build off of our network. One of the challenges that we're having is because we're a small county um, and I don't want to really criticize people, but this is a issue that we're having is that the rules are changing and the PSC grants are more directed at fiber to the home at 100 megabits per second. Um, that really is eliminating fixed wireless. But for us to build fixed wireless, um, uh, one company offered to do it for us for $118 million. Uh, we don't have $118 million. Um, so, uh, we apply for grants and we've been denied on every grant that we've applied for. We've submitted five grants and have been turned down on all of them because they're for towers with fixed wireless. And the big change is now the federal government has changed the standard to 100 megabits per second, which you've heard in other presentations. I think that makes it difficult on counties like Taylor County, Clark County, Rusk and Sawyer County that are right by us is that you know to lay that much fiber at this time is we really can't afford it. So we're gonna be looking at applying for grants to take fiber to the home in certain communities where it makes you know sense and where we can get ISP providers to come and do that. But we'll probably be having to look at other options in order to get people have internet access in the next two or three years that we're gonna to have to go like they're doing in Kiwani County, which is wonderful. That's, um, we're talking to Buck Tuskell, just like they did about putting up towers that will provide 20 to 50 megabits per second speed to all the residents of Taylor County within the next two or three years. We believe that's a stopgap measure 
we'd like to have fiber to the home, but we think it's going to take 10 to 12 years. We don't think we can wait 10 or 12 years to get access, you know, for students to have access. You know, when um, uh, the uh, governor's broadband committee, which did a lot of excellent work, um, but when they talk about 75% of the residents having certain speeds by 2024, um, that's going to mostly be urban areas. When you talk about, you know, the Gilman's and the Rib Lake school district of the, of the state of Wisconsin, where most of the residents are outside of, of uh, communities, um, we're gonna probably have to go wireless at least for the next you know, five, six or 10 years. So uh, we'll probably be doing some fixed wireless projects and applying for grants to take fiber to the home in parts of Taylor County. Um, the funding is really the challenge for I think smaller counties is that we don't have, our county doesn't have a full-time internet person. Um, I'm a county board supervisor who does this part-time because I volunteered. Um, so applying for grants can be challenging. There are a lot of paperwork. If anything could ever be done to streamline that, I think that'd be beneficial. I think what um, the PSC offered last summer, which was um, assistance in doing grants, that would be another nice feature if they could do that again. Um, but uh, Chris, you look like you have a question. Probably, no, I was just gonna say one more minute, Mike. And by the way, you're doing terrific by winging this because uh, my apologies for the misunderstanding, but that word document will be posted on the summit. You, you did great. Okay, and uh, but uh, back to what some of the other speakers have said is that um, communication, getting people involved, one of our challenges really was to go out and um, educate our county board, educate the businesses. We um, initially did a survey like some other people did. And we were surprised. 70% of the people that responded to our survey said they were looking for county government to solve this problem. I mean, you don't really hear that the people want government to solve their problem. A lot of people want less government. Um, so it uh, really was helpful to go out and ask the people what they wanted. And we heard it loud and clear. And I think that's why we got such great support from our county board. Um, we now have our county board has authorized another $1.5 million um, to build uh, wireless um, connections. So um, we're looking forward to the next steps in Taylor County. Um, I know I talked really fast and I'm sorry about that, but if anybody has any questions, please just reach out to me and we can share our RFP with you. And we can also um, uh, share our contract that we have with Wayne Wack, who is the company that's building our network so that you don't have to start from scratch. We'll be happy to share anything we can with you. No, once again, thank you, Mike. Uh, and you did, you did absolutely great, Wayne telling the story of Taylor County. Now to talk about state and federal funding is Alyssa Kenny, Director of Digital Access for the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin. Alyssa, are you ready? Hi, I'm ready. Okay. Good day to you. Well, thank you everyone. And thank you to UW Extension for inviting me um, to come and speak this morning. Um, and thank you to everyone for your patience and sticking it out as I'm one of the last speakers. And so um, next slide, please. Just really quickly, I work in the Wisconsin, I oversee the Wisconsin Broadband Office in the Digital Equity and Universal Service Fiend at the Commission. And our vision is that all Wisconsinites have the information technology capacity. So that's that robust, affordable broadband, but it's also the devices, the digital literacy um, and the support. And then our mission is really around high performance broadband becoming more accessible, resilient and affordable in Wisconsin. For the interpreter, could we please slow down for a, li a little bit? Thank you. I will go slower. Um, I'll just talk a little about how we're intending to reach our goals and the five strategies that our office is trying to employ. The first is leadership and vision. And so we see broadband as a solvable problem. 
Um, it's not an intractable problem. It's solvable with the right leadership and vision and good strategy. We heard already today about data and maps, um, but our office and the commission really see the use of data and maps as a key strategy. And I should say data and maps inform, but really the people of Wisconsin and that survey data and the experiences of people on the ground also do a lot to shape the decisions and the funding and the direction. Um, what I'm mostly here to talk about today is the strategic investment in infrastructure and the broadband grant program. Um, but that's a, a key activity of our office is distributing those broadband expansion grants. Um, and then just this summer, we had the opportunity to distribute ARPA funds, American um, Rescue Plan dollars. We try to use a digital equity and inclusion framework. It's been mentioned already, but there's a um, stakeholders group that meets monthly where we're working to work on a state plan for that and also, also just strengthen the, the practitioners across the state that are doing this work. And finally, and maybe most important, partnership and capacity building. Our office is very small and we hear again and again and all morning we've heard from all the people who are doing the work on the ground um, through extension, through libraries, through school districts, um, through economic development organizations, through internet service providers. Uh, there are many, many people doing this work. Next slide, please. These are some of the things that you'll find um, available from our office and on our website. Some of the things we've done, I'm gonna talk about the grants today. Our maps have already been um, addressed. We have two um, certifications for local communities, broadband forward and telecommuter forward. We spent a number of, um, a lot of resources in the last year focusing on COVID response. So listing emergency offerings. Our office stood up a phone and internet helpline that's received thousands of calls um, regarding supporting people getting internet and then a CARES Act grant. We're the staff for the governor's task force on broadband access. And um, we were a partner in the connectors pilot that people have spoken about earlier. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, and so I'll say I, I had to send in my slides a little early. Um, and so I said, stay tuned when I put my slides together and there's no more stay tuned. Um, we know what the timeline for the grants are. The Governor Eveners announced the grants last Monday, November 8th. Um, the state broadband expansion state program will be open on December 1st. So that's the date you can find the application and the instructions and the map and it will be for $100 million. And so that's the largest state grant round ever, and it's more money than distributed in all previous rounds, um, all previous state rounds. The goal of this program, and I've heard again and again, people have applied and received funding this morning, um, is to encourage the deployment of advanced telecommunications to underserved areas of the state. And the funds are largely for infrastructure, but also some of those ancillary costs that might make that infrastructure um, be of good use. So marketing, outreach, planning, and other support. Again, they'll be available on our website December 1st. Next slide, please. So who may apply for a state broadband grant? Um, an organization that's operated for-profit or non-profit, including a cooperative, a telecommunications utility, and then if a city or a town or a political subdivision would wish to apply, they need to be applying in partnership with a telecommunications utility. So when communities apply, they often apply in partnership. Um, indigenous nations and tribes and sovereign nations can apply on their own as their separate sovereign nations. So those are the eligible applicants. And then if you could do the next slide, please. There's two, um, two things that you need to think about about where a grant can be awarded. One is what I would call the eligibility threshold. So you have to be eligible to apply. And so that's an underserved area. And that's an area served by fewer than two providers offering broadband service. An unserved area, that's a much smaller area. That's an area of the state where the there's only one provider and people have less than 20% of broadband. So generally 
six megabits down and one megabit up. I'm kind of estimating there. And that's a priority factor. So underserved is eligibility, unserved is priority. And now here's the really confusing piece is now the feds are getting into these categories too, right? So depending on the grant, underserved and unserved may have different definitions. And so I would always really encourage people to look really carefully at those because the FCC has one, NTIA has one, the state has one. It's getting kind of complicated to follow those two. Next slide, please. Um, and then these are just the specific items. And I've heard a lot of people talk about these already, but the commission looks at the matching funds, what's available already, scalability, that the project won't delay service in an adjacent area, those public-private partnerships that we've heard about again and again today, project impact and economic impact. And so this is sort of the, the scoring matrix. This is how um, the commission looks and determines the merit. I'm gonna pivot over to federal funding for one quick minute. Um, if you would go to the next slide, please. And, and let me just say, uh, I did these slides, I think on November 1st, and they already feel out of date because the Infrastructure and Jobs Act was signed into law by President Biden yesterday. Um, so I'm gonna go through some of these, but there's a lot more federal funding coming for broadband now. Um, but I would just really start by encouraging, there's the emergency broadband benefit that provides a $50 per month discount. We have about 140,000 households in the state of Wisconsin using that benefit, 80, that's only 20% of the eligible households. This emergency broadband benefit will become the affordability connectivity fund and will become permanent with the infrastructure bill. It will be reduced to $30, become a permanent benefit. We have RDOF, there's a auction that's complete. That's a, where providers can bid on locations to provide service over the next year, next eight years, sorry. Emergency connectivity fund for schools and libraries. Reconnect, this one is currently open. Um, their grant will open on November 24th and be due in February. And I've heard people mention these two already, but there was the tribal connectivity fund that's closed with decisions soon, infrastructure, and then the connecting minority communities pilot, and that one's due December 1st. So these are some of the open ones. And then obviously the infrastructure um, act will be, um, there'll be a lot more money coming to the state for broadband deployment, digital equity and affordability. And I think with that, I'm perfectly at time, I hope, but I, in the last slide, I have um, our contact information in our website. If people have more uh, questions, I'd strongly encourage people to, to head over to our website after December 1st for information about the grant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Much appreciated. I'll just mention that I am a, uh, as the NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, is getting a lot of attention and mention today, as it should, that I am currently a volunteer grant reviewer for the last six weeks for the NTIA and the Tribal Connectivity Program. I've reviewed approximately 20 grants from Maine to California. And it has been a very interesting learning experience. These grants are for both broadband use and adoption and infrastructure deployment. So, but let me introduce our last speaker of the day. And last but absolutely not least, we very much want to hear from the EDA. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Tom Barron. Tom, you are you uh, cho chose to go slideless, as I recall. Tom yes. Barron, Economic Development Representative from the Economic Development Administration. We're delighted to have you. Please, you're on, Tom. Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me okay? We can indeed. No, thank you. Great, great. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, my name is Tom Barron. I'm an Economic Development Representative with EDA. Um, I serve the state of Wisconsin. Um, my role with EDA is to assist applicants through the what we call the project development process or getting uh, applicants ready to apply for EDA funding. Uh, just wanted to run through a couple of things today. Um, first off, I'll talk a bit about EDA as an organization, um, about how EDA serves communities, um, talk about broadband and the connection with EDA, and then uh, wrap up with some contact information. So um, EDA as an organization, 
We are housed um, under the United States Department of Commerce. We are engaged in doing economic development projects throughout the country. Um, to accomplish this mission, we are organized into six regional offices. Um, Wisconsin uh, falls under the Chicago Regional Office. Um, as I mentioned, I'm what's called an economic development representative serving the state of Wisconsin. With that, I, I do live in Wisconsin. I, I work out of my home in the, the Appleton area. Um, moving on to how EDA serves communities. Um, EDA does assist communities and entities that demonstrate distress or a, a special need as we call it through grants. Um, grants are developed and awarded through a competitive application process. So folks do have to fill out a series of, of forms in an application package and submit that. Um, EDA has a it, what's called an investment review committee that reviews the applications and then makes determinations on which grants will move forward. Um, so to be an eligible applicant to EDA, you need to be either a unit of government, so anything from a township all the way up to a county or state, um, and pretty much everything in between, a federally recognized tribe, uh, higher education, a, or a nonprofit organization. Um, entities that are not eligible for EDA funding include for profit entities and individuals. Uh, so, what are some examples of projects that EDA regularly participates in? Um, I would say, generally speaking, EDA assists areas in recovering from an event that causes economic damage. Uh, most notably, is COVID 19, um, and that's where our our uh, current funding opportunities are designed to help communities recover from. More traditionally, uh, EDA looks to assist communities that have uh, traditional distress from EDA's perspective, which is measured from a per capita income perspective or an unemployment rate. Um, other special need criteria that may make applicants eligible to apply for EDA funding um, fall in the what's called the special need category. This could include a uh, FEMA declared disaster, if an area is experiencing population loss or there's uh, um, pretty significant job losses, those are also qualifying events. So in general, uh, projects are typically responsive to that distress or special need. Um, most EDA projects have some sort of recovery um, effort built into them or help areas become more resilient to future economic damage. Again, with COVID-19 as being the, you know, the, the um, kind of the current um, emergency we're dealing with, a lot of grants that are being funded will help those areas both recover from COVID-19 and build resiliency from future pandemics or say other um, disasters, if you will. Uh, there is also typically an economic justification to a, a project, um, and that is demonstrated in multiple ways. Sometimes it's job creation or job retention. It could be private investment, or in planning efforts, it could be you can see the indirect ways that a, uh, that, that a project will help an area um, grow economically. Um, just kind of a, a quick sample of some of the types of projects we do. Um, on the planning side, we do economic diversification planning, economic development strategy development. Um, we also do, um, on our construction side, we do physical infrastructure, um, say on a uh, business park, we would provide sewer, water, roads, things of that nature. And we also construct um, incubators, business incubators and accelerators. Some projects that are, are challenging for EDA to participate in include uh, projects that are primarily residential in nature and projects that do not demonstrate a uh, clear economic justification. So now I'm gonna move into EDA and broadband. Um, I, I would say EDA is, is fairly new to the broadband space. Um, we, we typically apply our normal project um, kind of thoughts with, with funding broadband projects. Um, so we take it from the approach of sometimes um, applicants need to focus on a planning or strategy development of broadband. And sometimes it's a, what we would call an implementation or typically a construction project for, for broadband. 
Um, I think there's certainly a lot of connections that I heard throughout the, the morning here. Um, and, and when I think about the public service commissions um, and of the access, affordability, and adoption approach, I would say that the majority of EDA projects probably align um, with the access and particularly with the infrastructure component with that. I wanted to share uh, two um, broadband projects that have recently been funded in Wisconsin. Um, one, I, I think we already spoke or, or heard quite a bit about, so I'll keep it pretty brief. That's with the New North um, Planning and uh, Gap Analysis Project. I, I think that is, is a, a great way to summarize an EDA project. Uh, New North came forward with a demonstrated need that there was an economic justification for doing the project and that they, they had the uh, capacity to undertake the project and therefore it was awarded. Um, this project was funded under what's called the CARES Act, which uh, means New North did also demonstrate a, uh, a connection to COVID-19 and that the project would help uh, the, the area recover from COVID-19 and build resiliency. I'm kind of switching gears to a uh, EDA funded project on the construction side of the portfolio is with no Mosaic Technologies. Um, and this would be in the Northwestern part of Wisconsin. Um, this is gonna be taking place in Barron and Washburn counties. Um, and it involves a nonprofit broadband provider. And this includes the installation of approximately 72 miles of fiber um, in the project area. This project, uh, the total project cost is about $5.7 million. Um, EDA is funding about $2.6 million for this project. Um, some of the distress that the applicant demonstrated with this project is that there is a uh, per capita income um, issue in the area where some of the communities there um, are less than 80% of the national average for per capita income. And they also demonstrated COVID-19 um, impacts. So I think just quickly there, that's you know just two example projects. Um, I would encourage folks, if you are interested in having EDA um, fund your broadband work to, to reach out to EDA in several ways. The first one is through eda.gov. Uh, I think there's a lot of great resources on the page. In particular, in the upper right, there's a search bar. Uh, if you simply type in broadband in that search bar, you're gonna get a result of press releases for projects that EDA has funded. So you can get a sense of uh, additional you know, projects that, that EDA is participating in and kind of get a sense of what EDA is looking to fund. Um, next, uh, Wisconsin's regional planning commissions are a, a great resource. Um, many of them are what's called economic development districts under EDA, which means there's a uh, partnership that exists between the Regional Planning Commission and EDA. Um, they, they have a lot of knowledge. Some of them provide assistance in preparing applications, and uh, I'm in touch with them quite regularly, and they're a, a great uh, partner to have. Um, additionally, you can contact me directly. I'm going to uh, share right now in the, the chat box my contact information. Um, please feel free to reach out uh, via my, my uh, direct phone line that's included there or via email. And with that, I will uh, wrap up my presentation. And again, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Tom and all the panelists. And before I turn it over to Kristen, I just wanted to read one thing in the chat that was, it's not a question per se, but from Marianne, Marianne Lippard, whom we heard from earlier, but it says, while fiber to the premise is the gold standard is, I believe there is a role for fixed wireless in sparsely populated rural areas. We who live in those areas cannot wait for 10 plus years. That's that's very true, and I think that's the way, uh, I think there's uh, quite a bit of agreement around that. I think, Mike, I think that was particularly in reference to your uh, comment with respect to pursuing wireless. It's, uh, it's, it works very well in many cases. So, uh, Kristen, with that, I will uh, turn it over to you because I think we're, uh, we certainly want to have, have uh, questions, and I think we want to hear from Benoit. Uh, am I correct? 
You are correct. Thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it over to Benoit Jacob, our, our Director of Community Development Institute, and he'll have a few words and then we will keep the line open for those who are able to or want to remain on in chat. Most of our presenters, as I understand it, have commitments that they might need to be leaving, but those of us who are with Extension have the ability to, will stay on and do what we can to connect you with resources. So Benoit, over to you. Great, super. Um, I really have a, a fairly simple job today, uh, really mostly just to thank folks for their participation here. Um, I'll just offer this real, real quickly just in terms of background. So as Kristen introduced me, I'm the director of the Community Development Institute here, which is one of the six institutes that shape, uh, uh, shape extension. As such, uh, our role uh, as CDI, the Community Development Institute, is really to help foster and advance uh, thriving communities throughout the state. Obviously, um, you know, a critical obstacle or a critical opportunity for, for doing that is access to broadband. And so this summit today, uh, from our point of view, is clearly a critical and important priority. One that CDI and Extension intends to continue to support and uh, work within. And so thank you very much for, uh, to the panelists and speakers who presented today. Uh, and offered their expertise and thought is, is much appreciated. Thanks to everyone who attended. Uh, and I'll just say uh, quickly then, Extension you know, intends to continue to support and partner with communities. And so please feel free to reach out to us uh, to the degree we can, we can support uh, you all through our research and education uh, activities. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming today. Um, on behalf of the Division of Extension, um, as Benoit said, thank you for being here. We will officially end, but we will keep the line open. So those of us that would like to continue to chat um, have the opportunity to do so. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, this is Joe Bradley with the USDA Telecommunications Program. I was listening or was trying to listen off and on between several other meetings I had going. Uh, but I wanted to offer my assistance in regard to uh, the ReConnect program as well as other programs that USDA has. Um, I sent the email off and hopefully somebody's got it, but should I give you my contact information? That would be fantastic, yes. And as you give sure. it to us, I will type it in our chat. Excellent. Uh, so the email address is joe.bradley -E at usda.gov, joe.bradley at usda.gov. The phone number is 325-266-4818. And uh, again, 325-266-4818. And the reason why that's a Texas phone number is, that, is that's where I live, but I cover temporarily Wisconsin as well. Um, and so, uh, and the permanent person is Andre Boning. Uh, he's on a, a different detail and things of this sort for right now. But nonetheless, I can answer any questions you guys may have either now or later on uh, regarding the ReConnect program or telecommunications program in general. Thank you, Joe. We did receive the email. We'll post that to our website as well, your information, um, and make sure that we Please put do. people in contact. And I am going to, I've posted your contact details in the chat, but please feel free to share whatever you would like to with us. Yeah. Okay, would you like me to discuss a few things now or? Sure, sure, yeah. If you want to take a minute or two to tell us a little bit about, about um, what's going on. If I'm not putting you on the spot, I might be putting you on the spot, oh. I realize. Well, no, it, it's just that there's a lot of information. Um, and so the best thing to do is to subscribe to all of the alerts in my email uh, below my signature line there and things of this sort. But the ReConnect program, of course, is is going to be opening on um, August 24th and then closes for uh, in February 2022. Um, and so that's important things to consider. But there's also a webinar um, that's, that's available at the events page um, on the ReConnect website that I would recommend folks going to but also to subscribe to those alerts so that you're aware of other, other events that may occur in the near term. Uh, under the ReConnect program, the, the third ReConnect program, which is the one we're talking about now, because there's been two, two previous, there's 1.15 billion total in loans, loan grants, as well as grants themselves. 
there's also a uh, set aside, if you will, of $350 million uh, for tribal entities. Uh, so uh, that's definitely a consideration. Uh, $350 million for the grant, 100% grant. You got $250 million for the loan grant combination, 50-50, and then 100% loan. Now, the 100% loan is non-competitive, but it's also, most more importantly, it's a first come, first serve when it comes to qualified grants. And here's the, the neat part is it's 2% money, uh, which is pretty darn good money no matter what year you're, you're, you're in. Um, and so that's the Reconnect 3 program. Under the Infrastructure Act that the president just uh, signed the other day, uh, there's approximately $1.962 billion uh, but how that's going to be utilized and in, in the definition of where it can utilize is, is sort of in the works. So, but it's, it's definitely coming down the pike. Uh, there's also other programs that uh, Wisconsin telecommunications providers have been borrowing uh, from us for, for a long time uh, under the telephone loan program or infrastructure loan program. Now that's been going on since 1949. Um, and then of course we have distance learning telemedicine grant program. Uh, that is closed right now, but it's going to be opening up sometime, in, typically, whatever that is anymore, typically uh, the first quarter of the uh, beginning of the calendar year. And so I would definitely, uh, again, sign up for those alerts so you're aware of it. But if you have any questions regarding any of those programs, uh, please shoot me an email and or give me a call and we can kick things around. And again, I'm, I'm the temporary person uh, covering Wisconsin as well as Texas in my spare time. And so uh, if you got any questions, you know, get in touch with me. Uh, Joe, this is Joe. This is Brian uh, Gochi up in Lac de Flambeau uh, Reservation. Um, quick question. The deadline on those tribal set asides, what's the deadline, de date deadline on that? Uh, well, it's for the entire Reconnect 3. That, it, that closes on February 22nd of next year, 2022. Okay. Just checking. Now, yeah, and and uh, please get a hold of me. We can talk. I, before uh, living in Texas, I did a lot of work with tribes in the Northwest, uh, and so I understand the the need and and the desire mm -hmm. to uh, to push out broadband. Okay. It's excellent. Thank you, Joe. Um, we will, I guarantee, have people reach out to you and we will work to put people in contact with you and the USDA. Um, one thing I will note not uh, as we're going into conversation, um, Remy and Judy, Judy, who have been our excellent and hardworking Spanish interpreters um, doing this live on the Spanish language channel have asked as we're having conversation, if we can speak slowly and for somebody like or look probably a little slower than we normally speak uh, somebody like me who is a fast talker um, I'm gonna have to keep that in mind and I, and Judy feel free to chime in and remind me to, to not go 100 miles an hour um, thank you thank you you're welcome you guys have been amazing <laughs> thank you amazing. yeah thank you yeah and we have um, a question that Jeff put into the chat it's two questions for the PSC. Can ARPA dollars be used as matching funds and will fixed wireless be considered as suitable technology as long as it meets the 25-3 speeds? And Oneida County is extremely difficult for fiber given the topography and the lakes. This is Alyssa. Alyssa. Could, could you repeat that? I'm sorry, could you repeat that last part? Oneida County is extremely difficult for fiber given the topography and the lakes. So the answer I think to the first question is can ARPA funds be used to match a state broadband expansion grant? The answer is yes, as long as, or yes, as far as the state broadband um, program is concerned. Certainly you have to make sure that it's an allowable, how you're planning to use the funds is an allowable use of ARPA. Um, but from our side, it's allowable. And then the second, will fixed wireless be cons considered for the state grant program? The answer is yes, that's an allowable technology. It is 
we continue to be technology neutral, but I like to say technology neutral, but pro performance, right? So we're still focused on performance. We still care about the performance. The commission wants to know um, for a fixed wireless project, how high will the towers be? Is the spectrum licensed or unlicensed? You know, what's the, what's the quality of the project is still very important to the commission and to the application. So it's not just the technology, it's the entire quality of the, the technology. I hope that answers your question, Jeff. And he says, thank you, very helpful. Other questions or comments? While people are thinking of, of what to ask next, I personally want to acknowledge Brandon Hofstad, um, Chris Stark, and Gail Hike for all of the work they put into this. Brandon um, was intended to moderate today, but through the magic of live demonstration of the need for broadband <laughs> is able to be on but not moderate and do Zoom at the same time. So I have been using his script today, so. Uh, Kristen, this is Steve Deller here. I do have one question that I put out to the, the group that's still on is that we're gonna do a follow-up um, evaluation survey, I believe. And one thing that I'd like to ask is uh, in terms of kind of our conferences and workshops and whatnot, um, we usually do these face-to-face, -face, but with COVID, we kind of shifted and we went virtual. And is this virtual format still a good way to be doing these kind of workshops? Or would you prefer that we start to go more back face to face. Uh, because I think the, the premise was everybody thought, well, we'll just go back face to face. And I think maybe people are kind of starting to say that this might be a, a good alternative way of delivering programming. So in, in the evaluation, if you could just kind of add, add your thoughts on that, that'd be appreciated. Thank you. Oh, the other thing that just struck me is, um, as I was listening to people talk, is the, the number of resources that are available across Wisconsin is just um, mind boggling. And it's really important for communities to, to reach out and to talk to their neighbors uh, and, and find out, even even somebody that's maybe on the other side of the state that has experienced this is in, in, the, in the state agencies and the university and all the other, um, the network of information that's available is just really impressive. And it's, it's important that even if you're from a small rural community to tap into that expertise and learn from what others across the state are doing. This is Brian, um, quick question or a comment maybe, is when it comes to working with tribes, uh, I wasn't able to get everything in that I wanted to today, but for those of you that are interested in something like that, please let, it, let me know because we, can, we do an in-service called Working Effectively with Tribal Communities. So if there's interest out there, we can set something like that up. And it usually takes a couple days to cover what I try to do in five minutes. Steve talked about making sure when you get the link to the evaluation that you comment on the format that you would like to see the information come. Um, as we develop that survey that you'll be receiving, we are asking what types of format you'd like to receive the information, and what other topics you'd really like us to concentrate on. We want people to know that this is just a first step. We hope to offer many different opportunities for folks to um, learn about broadband and learn from each other because learning and working through those partnerships and looking at all the resources available is what's going to help Wisconsin crack the nut and bring broadband access to everyone. We did have another question dropped in the chat, and this is from Nathan Sandwick. 
Um, as more public funds become available, um, are there enough contractors available in or around Wisconsin to do the work required to expand the infrastructure? Or should we anticipate bottlenecks in the short term that might hamper simultaneously pursuit of many projects at once? That's a great question. We don't see anybody jumping on that. So I think- Well, Chris, Dale, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into that mix. So um, I'll put my, um, my uh, Vilas County Economic Development uh, Corp hat on. And as we look at the various ISPs and we're talking with them constantly, it's, a, it's an issue. There's no question about it. Um, labor's an issue. The supply chain problems are an issue. There's a strain because there's so much demand and there's so much work. You know, where there's, where there's uh, constraints in any type of supply, that also creates opportunities. So this is, you know, this is prime time for organizations that want to get into that space because I think we all know there's a tremendous amount of work. Um, but if there are some of the ISPs uh, on board, they may have some really great input. Thank you. Bill, if I could follow up on that, I think you hit the nail on the head. There is going to be a shortage here. Um, there are going to be bottlenecks, but I think you're right in that this creates a great business opportunity for a lot of folks. Um, this is a real potential space for people to move into. Um, one of the things that uh, some of the communities have been struggling with is they can't get this. They're generally dominated by the larger internet service providers and the bigger internet service providers aren't interested in these thin markets. And some communities, um, I haven't heard of it in Wisconsin, but outside of Wisconsin have actually tried to, to encourage new business formation in terms of local internet service providers. And some folks have actually stepped into that space. Um, so I think it's um, kind of a yin and yang here um, is that rather than saying, geez, we can't get contractors to work uh, because the demand is so high, um, you know, be a little bit more aggressive in terms of maybe talking with some um, people that might be able to step into this space. I think that's a great point. Other questions or comments or suggestions for the good of the cause? This is August from uh, Brown County. My, my two cents is, is that groups matter. So the more connections you can make, whether that's committees, teams, groups, whatever it is, that's the magic. <laughs> Maps are great, don't get me wrong. They've been a great way to communicate. But if you don't have the, the group, if you don't have the committee, if you don't have the you know, that contact at the school board or that contact with the local college or university, whatever it is, it can't happen. You can't have that communication and you can't get the survey data. You know, I mean, if I'm very narrow and just talking about maps, I can't get it unless I've got the inputs and the inputs are the people. So the community is absolutely king in terms of getting data sets. And then those data sets that gets back to going back to the USDA guys and everybody else, you know, the FCC says I got good coverage. I got some data now that says that's not exactly accurate. So now you, you can have that conversation again and you still need to know who to talk to because if I don't present it right, you know, if I use the wrong definition, whoever was talking about the underserved versus unserved and the definitions, none of them match. <laughs> that's, a nightmare, but if you know the right people, you can solve that problem. So again, people are solving the problem. So that's my two cents. We have a question. Thank you very much, August. Um, I think we heard groups are groups matter. Um, and Marianne, you were nodding your head too. And I'm thinking of Bill's comment about putting 
the team together um, to work in in, um, in uh, Boulder Junction as well. Um, so we have a, a two questions in the chat. Um, Kelly Peterson uh, says, I'm a resident of Iron County and the only provider is CenturyLink slash Lumen. They used to offer 25 meg and in the last two years, they dropped it to 12 to 15 megs down. And uh, she is curious if there are better options on the internet since the internet in her region is copper from the house and 12 meg down and one meg up to the pole. Um, there's no fiber and she's aware that bug tussle was declined in Iron County. So. Chris, you're on mute. Oh, go ahead. Chris, you're on mute. Oh, I didn't have, I was, I was oh. curious to know why, uh, I, I don't have an answer to the, but I am, it, it, it uh, inspires questions. Of, does Kelly, if you, uh, you're on, I presume, um, why does, uh, I was, bug tussle was declined in Iron County, do you, do you know? Is there any particular reason for that? I, I can just maybe jump in from the PSC, as I can just say for the ARPA grant rounds, there was $443 million requested for a hundred million available. And so I don't think um, a proposal being declined necessarily reflects the value of the proposal as much as it reflects that there wasn't enough money in the, the pool or, or, you know, that there was less resources than there were good applications. And so I, I don't, I hope that people don't necessarily equate um, not getting funding as uh, a bad proposal as much as it was not, you know, in the top 25%. And so I, I you know, that would just be my, my commission comment. Yeah. Um, I would like to throw out the idea also of um, considering using an RFI process, request for information, and send that out to providers beyond Iron County. Sometime providers are interested in new opportunities or interested in expanding their service area. Um, that's really what worked with Jackson County. Um, the um, the RFI because we ca because a wide net was cast, there were a couple of providers that came in that didn't really previously have um, have internet service in Jackson County. Kelly, uh, so Kelly responded. This was a this was a local issue, and my understanding is is that the county board looked at the deal, and my understanding is the county board declined um, the the bond or or whatever that looked like. Um, as far as the issue with CenturyLink, what's going on with all of these service providers all over the country is especially with DSL. It's a shared service, so it's like trying to put um, 55 gallons into a 12 gallon bucket. It just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So the DSL service is, is being squeezed. And then the third thing I'll say is we haven't talked a lot about RDOF. So RDOF is, a, is the next generation of the federal funding. Look at that for your areas because RDOF, it's going to take time. There's no question about it, but it is a game changer. And in some areas, it's going to open doors that have not been open in the past. Well, the, One this thing, is not, well, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, we are going to end interpretation. We had interpretation until 12.15. Um, and the rest of us can continue the conversation, but thank you very much to Remy and to Judy for all of their work. They probably need to take a nap um, after the hard work of interpreting for all of us today. Um, and thank you very much to, to Carlos for arranging and facilitating everything. All right, uh, so go ahead. August. So this is August. I was just gonna respond to Kelly regarding um, the service and this is for anybody, all services local. 
you could be a quarter of a block away from high speed and still not have high speed. Or you might think you don't have high speed and you could have gig and a neighbor three houses down doesn't get anything. So location, 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 and you got to dig. Um, it's not straightforward to find the information about who provides where. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit techie mess, but the, the ladders still exist. Um, so there's edges and boundaries of service areas. And if you happen to live on one of those, you know about them. And if you don't, you never heard of them. Um, those things matter. So depending on where you live, your service, you, you might be serviced by somebody your neighbor isn't. That's all I'll say. So you've got to dig around to find out. And I, I don't think anybody on the call would be able to answer your question because you've got to have the exact street address and then you got to go research. It's just the way it goes. I'd like to go back to the to the Iron, Iron County, the, the county board not wanting to, to being unsure about the $8 million bond. Um, in terms of a lot of these grant programs, um, how much do the, does the local community have to kind of put resources into the into the applications? Um, I'm sure that if a community basically says we want we want the, the grant to pay for 100 percent of this investment, that's not going to be a competitive grant. But is there kind of a sweet spot there in terms of how much the community is willing to put in and match the grants or is it is it all over the board? So I've, I've been interacting, trying to find people statewide and the latter of your statement, the all over the board part is probably the best way to describe the state of Wisconsin. Um, everything from complete commitment to that it's the private sector's problem and we won't touch it. Okay. And, and, and I can't even, and it's not even consistent by area of the state. We talk to people in lower, lower south, what would it be, southwest corner and they're doing public private and you know interested and then there's areas right near there that don't want a thing to do with it and then you go a little bit north you're back into public private um you go farther north some of them have gone with kind of sponsoring the co-op thing or the the government's in effect funding an internet provider and they're competing with the private sector so there's it's all over the place I think you're right. It is all over the place. And one of the things that, you know, we look at that public private, but one of the things we looked at is with the governor's task force as well is how do we look to local philanthropy um, to help fund some of this? That's one of the things we're starting to explore. Other states do a much better job at looking at accessing those dollars. Um, I know we're looking at how Wisconsin may access those dollars and how could who could partner to help us funnel those dollars through in the state. Um, probably looking at WEDC and having the ability to help make some of that um, philanthropy happen in Wisconsin. So I think that's another thing that people should be looking at. Um, there's lots of opportunities for funding right now, but we can't leave any rock unturned. Speaking of that, that's one other thing I did not bring up because it, it wasn't appropriate for the conversation. But there's, depending on how you do the math, between a half a billion and a billion dollars sitting in township level funds under ARPA that probably only has one spending avenue and it's broadband. But that's sitting at the township level statewide so do the math, that's spread out, it's 20 grand here, 80 grand there, 100 grand here, and it's between a half a billion and a billion dollars probably still on the table. So to, this is gonna have to be ground up if we wanna try to take advantage of those funds. And I think that's one of the things we're finding some of those small towns don't know how to take advantage of that, thinking their town is too small. So I think the question in the chat earlier was, do we have to work within our town or within our county? And no, I think this is, that's a great example of what August is talking about, how some of those municipalities can join together to help build broadband out. I know that's one of the conversations that they were having in Taylor County with some of their towns. So um, like I said, 
Yeah, there isn't a magic formula. We just have to look at all the possibilities. We had another question from Jim Morley. He's heard that Charter Spectrum brought up a bunch of census blocks in his area and what might be the ensuing dynamics. Kristen, um, my, my, my sense is, is that is that's art off. If we could get a little bit, little bit more information, it may help, but it may be art off. I think Jim is still on. Huh. What, does, what does it mean buying up census blocks? What does that mean? Was that maybe from the CAF auction, the, the Connect America Fund auction, the, the, the latest round of CAF maybe? Yeah, the, the next evolution of CAF is RDOF, Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. And um, what was it, $9.3 billion in the United States. Of that charter one, I think 1.32 billion in the US. And, and that was based upon census blocks. And he says, yes, um, he believes it's the auction. <laughs> Um, Charter was the number two winner in RDOF. The number one winner was a company called LTD Broadband with like 1.68 billion. And right now those RDOF, um, they were, Charter and LTD were awarded the first round. They're go still going through the long form process of getting those funds approved and some of those, those census blocks. So more to come on the RDOF and how that's all gonna play out. Um, I have been in conversation with Charter and many of the communities that are sitting in those blocks um, are starting to have conversations with, with Charter and attempting conversations with LTD. And that's always one of the places to start. Have those conversations with those providers because especially if they were in those auctions, they may be able to tell you what their plans are and how those are proceeding. Yeah, thinking well, about that, my Brad. question would be, is there any is there any like reason to expect more accountability from this round of CAF auctions than we've seen in the past sort of rounds? Are there, you know, is there any kind of strict expectation that they actually do the build out? Uh, like some have and some haven't in the past, you know, with previous rounds for different areas. Chime in on that. I think that's definitely a concern. <clears throat> I think that uh, the amount of time they've allowed on the build out is really extended out. And I think the, the federal requirements are still at that 25-3. And let's face it, if 25-3 is what we're providing for a, a level of service, it's not adequate. So I think that uh, there's gonna be potentially some problems in that area. If you, if you have a look at the map, uh, there's, a, there's a link in the chat. There, there's a map to the, uh, the Ardoff uh, FCC auction. And uh, when you click, so take your mouse cursor and you click on that map, you can see who won, you can see the category in which they won. And I'm not familiar with the entire state, but most of what I look like, what I looked at, the areas were won by a gigabit provider. Mm -hmm. So that means fiber to the prem. Yeah, there are ways to do it wirelessly, but for the most part, it's gonna be fiber. And those, um, you're right, those most of them are that gig, which would be fiber, um, where they're going to fall in the timeline, because you're right, it doesn't all happen overnight. Um, that's part of that conversation that you have to have with those providers. Um, we find that often the people who have the conversations um, and are pushing the issue are the ones that are going to get noticed by those providers first. So it, it's important to have those conversations. The other thing is that final approval, they're going through that long-term and they're releasing some of those funds 
as they do that through the art of process that's taking maybe longer than people thought just because of some of the questions that Nathan said, they do want to make sure that those businesses have the capability to actually deliver the service that they said they were going to provide. Um, if you follow the art off um, website, they do show when they're releasing those. We haven't had a whole lot of late in Wisconsin that have shown up on the list that have been released through the long form yet, but that is a way to keep track of that and certainly talk to the providers and see where they're at in the process. I'd like to follow up with Gail on the talk to the providers in the process. Um, I was able to help with one of those conversations and we also talked about the broadband forward certification that, you know, again, broadband forward is the welcome mat and um, having a local municipality that takes the time to study that and then adopt a broadband forward ordinance can help move them up. All great information. This is a great discussion. Um, so helpful um, and a great opportunity to get some of these questions asked and talk with people who have had success and in putting teams together and getting broadband and advancing this for their communities. What other questions do we have or comments? If seeing no others, normally this would be the time where we'd go get ice cream somewhere as a group <laughs> and sit around and chat <laughs> and catch up. Uh, but since this is Zoom, if it is all right with folks, I think we'll bring our discussion today to a conclusion. Um, on behalf of those of us who um, were lucky enough to listen and gain um, insight and knowledge um, from your experiences and your research and your shared wisdom, Thank you so much. This has been 